Martin Heidegger was himself a highly accomplished lecturer on philosophy. When discussing a philosopher, he famously limited his discussion of that thinker's biography and life story to, he was born, he thought, he died. I generally tend to take the same approach. Our time is precious and limited, and I don't want to waste it giving you details that you can better find on Wikipedia. However, there are some details about Heidegger's life that are worth knowing before delving into his thought, so I'll do my best to address them here. Martin Heidegger was born in 1889 in the small, rural, conservative, and religious town of Meskach in southwest Germany. His father was a sexton, and he was raised as a Roman Catholic. He was a fairly private person and spent most of his free time in his country home in the Black Forest with his family. He was very fond of the outdoors and felt that spending time alone in nature was essential to doing his greatest, clearest thinking. His favorite of many outdoor pursuits was skiing. In 1917, he married a woman named Elfrida Petri, whom he remained with for life. However, behind closed doors, the two had something of an open marriage, as both of them knew about and conducted extramarital affairs. Heidegger's two most sustained lovers were Elisabeth Blockmann and Hannah Arendt, two notable scholars in their own right. He raised two sons with Elfrida, although only one of them was biologically his own. He died in 1976 in his hometown of Meskach. Originally, Heidegger planned to enter a Jesuit seminary, but was disqualified because of a heart condition, which was possibly psychosomatic. As such, his entry to philosophy came via a study of Aristotle, as understood through medieval scholastic thinkers like John Duns Scotus. Heidegger eventually entered the University of Freiburg as a lecturer, primarily focused on ancient Greeks and medieval scholasticism. However, his philosophical influences would soon broaden. Some of the most important thinkers for his later thought included Immanuel Kant, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Søren Kierkegaard. The two most influential thinkers to the early Heidegger were Edmund Husserl and Wilhelm Dilthey. We see the influence of these two most clearly in his major breakout work, Being and Time. Heidegger became an assistant and eventually close friend of Husserl, who taught at the same university. There is an elephant in the room when discussing Heidegger's personal life, which has, unfortunately, cast a negative shadow over much of his philosophical work. In 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. The same year, Heidegger became rector of the University of Freiburg. Soon afterwards, he enthusiastically became a member of the Nazi party. He made his support of Adolf Hitler, the Nazi regime, and Nazi youth movements apparent to all. As rector, he also oversaw the implementation of countrywide laws that kept Jewish academics out of privileged positions in universities. However, there are also reports that he did not allow anti-Jewish posters or book burnings on campus. He had several close Jewish friends and colleagues before and after the war who would later defend him, including his lovers Blochmann and Arendt. He abandoned his post as rector the next year in 1934 and never again actively involved himself in politics, although he remained a member of the Nazi party all the way until its disillusion in 1945. After the war, Heidegger was pronounced a Mietlaufer, or fellow traveler, by occupying authorities, meaning he was not directly guilty of any crimes, but he was unable to be formally exonerated of involvement either. He was banned from teaching for four years, after which he was allowed to return as a professor emeritus, but never again as philosophy chairman. How exactly to interpret the full picture of this is still debated, often with a lot of acrimony. Frustratingly, Heidegger never officially apologized for his time as a Nazi. Those who are unsympathetic to him will say that it is a sign of weakness in him as a thinker and intellectual. If they are particularly extreme, they might write off his entire philosophy as the work of a fascist, a very idiosyncratic one, but a fascist nevertheless. They might use the so-called black notebooks as evidence, personal writings only published in 2014 
that reveal Heidegger mixing his own philosophical thoughts with common anti-Semitic tropes of Jews as materialistic, scheming, rootless cosmopolitans. I personally do not share this view. I will agree that there is much Heidegger wrote that is odious, and that he was a man of many moral failings and poor judgments. But I do think his philosophy is largely independent of his personal failings, and can be meaningfully separated from them. Those like me who are sympathetic have our own sources and facts to point to. Heidegger himself would later say that as a lecturer during the Nazi years, he did his best to subtly critique and undermine the Nazi party line, which he saw himself as deeply in contrast to. Of course, the repressive policies of the time meant that he had to hide his critiques in coded language. He spoke repeatedly of what he saw as the, quote, inner truth and greatness of the Nazi movement, which was apparently deeply in opposition to whatever was common practice and ideology around him. Much of what Heidegger saw as appealing in Nazism will become more clear as we become more familiar with his later thought, but I can summarize it as the following. Heidegger was deeply uncomfortable and disillusioned with the way the world seemed to be progressing into modernity. He felt great unease at the seeming nihilism and lack of purpose in a society that was increasingly modern, technological, and jaded. He longed for there to be a great philosophical renewal that would open up new pathways of thought and thus of being, something like a return to ancient Greece where everything seemed meaningful and open to possibility. And he believed that the German people would be the ones who had the duty to do this, primarily because of their intellectual heritage as well as their language and its similarity to ancient Greek. It is easy to see how Heidegger could have been caught up in the Nazi zeitgeist and seen a reflection of his hope in the mood of the times. In the end, though, while he never admitted it so explicitly, it is clear in my opinion from his later writings that he saw Nazism as another example of modernity becoming inhumane and blinded. One might critique him for equalizing the Nazis with other regimes and ideologies of modernity, but it was clear that by the end we can at the very least say that his opinion of them was negative. One of the primary ways he felt this was a strong rejection of what he called the overly biological thinking of the Nazis. That is, he highly disagreed with the belief that German culture and thought was to be only Aryan culture and thought. He saw the value of the German Volk as primarily being something that was based on thought, language, and culture, and not on genetics. He spoke mockingly of Nazis whose idea of the value and meaning of their people could be reduced to skull measurements. This antipathy went both ways. The Nazi leadership saw Heidegger as a crank and thought his writings were nonsense. He was considered to be disposable enough that in 1944 he was drafted into the Volkssturm, the desperate and final emergency national conscription of able-bodied men into the army, to build fortifications on the Rhine. I think that this is good evidence that Heidegger was by no means a simple Nazi ideologue, and I personally believe that his philosophy can be completely disconnected from all of these personal failings. With all this in mind, you might now be asking, why bother with Heidegger? Why not focus on someone who you don't have to engage with all these complex moral qualms about instead? Well, the answer is simply that no one can replace Heidegger. We know this because many wanted to replace him with someone more palatable ethically. But there is simply no one who opened up the possibilities of philosophy in the 20th century in the way that he did, except perhaps for Ludwig Wittgenstein, in my opinion. But whereas Wittgenstein's influence is more palpable in the English-speaking world, despite the fact that he wrote in German, in Europe, no one takes greater precedence than Heidegger. Indeed, much of the so-called analytic continental divide in Western philosophy can be traced back to an acceptance or rejection of Heidegger. As such, there is simply no understanding 20th century philosophy, especially in Europe, without understanding Heidegger. And I think that he is especially appropriate for our modern age as well. Many of our modern problems of nihilism and hopelessness, of technology and its ill effects, and of the spiritual damage of ecological devastation can only be answered, in my opinion, by Heidegger. On a personal level, I also find him very interesting because I think no Western philosopher is more Japanese than Heidegger, and I'm not the first to point this out. Many from the East and the West have pointed out the similarity of his thought to 
Zen, Taoist, and Shinto traditions in the East. In many ways, Heidegger's role in the 20th century is profoundly ironic and full of contradictions. It was the Nazi Heidegger who ended up becoming the single greatest influence on modern and even postmodern thought in Europe. All kinds of thinkers who the Nazis would have considered socially corrosive degenerates could not have existed without Heidegger, from Sartre to Adorno to Derrida to Foucault to Habermas. What is most interesting about this, however, is that Heidegger pushed the Western world so far into modernity not by rejecting the foundations of Western thought, but by engaging with them more seriously than anyone had done in 2,000 years. Indeed, Heidegger precisely was able to destroy the 2,000-plus year history of Western metaphysics, not because he moved past it, but because only he dared to go far enough back. His later writings speak to almost no one from the present era, and have far more in common with ancient wise men like Lao Tzu and Heraclitus than Kant or Hegel. It was only Heidegger who dared to go far back enough to reawaken the most fundamental questions from the mysterious and murky era of pre-Socratic thought. It was only Heidegger who dared to take philosophy back from the logicians and scientists and give it back to the poets and sages. Being and Time was not the first thing Heidegger ever published, but pretty much everything he published prior to Being and Time reads like a kind of practice and early working out of themes better expressed in it. At the same time, pretty much every theme in later Heidegger is somehow prefigured and dependent upon understanding Being and Time. So there really is only one right place to begin with studying Heidegger, and it is this text. It is a difficult text. It is long. It is written in torturously dry and exacting prose. And it has an extremely idiosyncratic lexicon of invented and repurposed words that make comprehending its themes often feel akin to learning a new language. Any researcher will tell you that you simply must read a philosopher in their original tongue to fully grasp them, but Heidegger is an especially strong case of it. Much of the meaning and nuance of the words he uses to introduce new concepts are very connected to the German language. But, as Miles Groth points out in an interview with the Heidegger website Ereignis, it is not so much that the difficulty of Heidegger is that you need a German thesaurus to understand all the obscure and difficult academic words he uses. Heidegger was a country boy, and his terminology is deeply connected to everyday colloquial expressions. It is rather an awareness of German as it is spoken in its native, natural, almost slang-like nuances that makes Heidegger's terminology more understandable. It is impossible to capture all of this in the English, but translators have tried. Although it has its problems, the, translating, the translation of Being in Time that I continue to use is the first 1962 translation by John McCary and Edward Robinson, with a few particularly misleading phrases revised. In spite of all those difficulties, I think it is an extraordinarily rewarding work, and I highly recommend anyone to read it, either along with or after this video, in addition to the excellent commentaries that I will often be referencing, including but not limited to those by Michael Gelvin, Hubert L. Dreyfus, and William Blattner. Introduction Chapter 1 The Necessity, Structure, and Priority of the question of being. What is being and time about? It is a complex work which touches on a lot of things, but the truth is that it is a very intensely focused book in terms of its objective. That objective is an attempt to answer a very simple question. That question really is the question that is the guiding light for Heidegger's entire philosophical career. It is, according to him, the fundamental and first question of all of philosophy. And yet this question has by and large been forgotten and passed over by the Western philosophical tradition for almost 2,000 years. That question is, what is being? What does it mean to be? This is a question which is bound to be misinterpreted so Heidegger first wants to take some time to explain the wrong way to go about answering this question, and what pitfalls we need to avoid. The first thing to make explicit 
is what Heidegger calls the ontological difference. What does this mean? Well, ontology refers to the philosophical discipline which deals with being. Some traditional questions that might occur in ontology are, does God exist? Do minds exist apart from material bodies? Does the external world exist apart from our conception of it? And so on. Note, however, that all of these refer to something existing. What does this actually mean? What do we have in mind when we say something exists or doesn't exist? Or in even more basic language, what do we have in mind when we say something is or isn't? That is why Heidegger wants to understand being. But this is precisely where the way we speak and use language can mislead us conceptually. If I phrase the question as, what is being, it looks the same in structure as something like, what is a dog, what is an idea, what is water, what is nitrogen, and so on. All of these take after the form, what is X, where we plug some thing in place of X. But in asking the question of being, Heidegger isn't so much interested in the X as he is in the is. That is to say, Whatever being means, it can't just be one thing among other things in the world. We can't just have mountains, trees, rivers, wishes, poems, dreams, rules, and then being as one of those things among others, even if it is somehow ranked above all the others in a hierarchy as the most universal or most foundational. This difference between things or entities and being itself is the ontological difference. Note that it isn't merely a difference between things that are material and actual and those that are not. Abstract entities like numbers and fictional entities like unicorns would also be on the thing side of the ontological difference and be opposed to being itself. This is why Heidegger calls his work one of fundamental ontology. He's not just asking about what kind of things there are and how they are, but what it actually means to be in the first place. Whatever being means, it can't just be a being among other beings. It wouldn't really answer the question of what being means to just turn being into one entity among others. And yet, that is precisely what philosophers have tried to do for the past 2,000 years, which is why this question never really gets answered. Roughly from Plato onward, philosophers have always tried to ground being in some particular thing or entity, be it idea, process, substance, god, monad, noumenon, will to power, or whatever else. All those theories really do is shuffle around the sort of conceptual, metaphysical furniture that we have. They never really answer what being means. This means that we have to move in a fundamentally different way and be sure to never start thinking of being as if it is a kind of ultimate, transcendent, metaphysical entity that stands above our mortal existence. That is the exact opposite of how we need to conceptualize it. That is why a better way of framing the question is not as what is being, but what is it to be? As you could guess from the title, Heidegger's provisionally suggested answer is that ultimately being has something to do with time. But how exactly these two are related has to be carefully answered, and we will need to approach it in a radically different way than any other philosopher has. Chapter 2 the twofold task in working out the question of being, method and design of our investigation. Now that the question is clear, we have to think about how exactly to answer it. Obviously, we can't answer it the same way so many other thinkers have tried to in the past. In Heidegger's words, quote, The being of entities is not itself an entity. If we are to understand the problem of being, our first philosophical step consists in not mython tina diestai, in not telling a story, that is to say, in not defining entities as entities by tracing them back in their origin to some other entities, 
as if being had the character of some possible entity. Hence being, as that which is asked about, must be exhibited in a way of its own, essentially different from the way in which entities are discovered. Entities, by the way, is the word that is going to be our general term to refer to things that are on the other side of the ontological difference from being itself. That is, things like flowers, candles, atoms, speeches, aspirations, etc. The difference will remain much more clear if we have a division between being and entities than between being and beings. But now we have a problem. How can we study something that isn't an entity? Heidegger's answer is via the method of phenomenology. Phenomenology is a field that largely owes its existence to Heidegger's mentor Edmund Husserl. The main goal of phenomenology, compared to other disciplines, is to study conscious experience from the inside. By making observations and descriptions of the manner and structure in which we experience and conceptualize things, we can hopefully arrive at something that is revealing more generally. For Heidegger, the only way to arrive at being itself and not just individual entities is to study the structure of phenomenal experience. Only then can we peer into what seems to be there but that we remain unconscious of. Heidegger's conception of phenomenology is very different from Husserl's, but both seek to reach philosophical insights via the careful and unbiased description of what is most real to us, our conscious experience. It might sound strange to get at the question of fundamental ontology via phenomenology. Heidegger's hope, however, is that by describing the way some particular thing exists in a particularly careful, attentive, and thorough way, he can make us notice the general structure of being itself. The best analogy to explain how this goes on comes from a commentary by William Blattner, who I will quote directly. Quote, as an analogy, think of what it is like to try to get someone to see a painting as you do. You might well appreciate or enjoy the removal of St. Mark's body from the funeral pyre by Tintoretto, but not be able to articulate aspects of the painting that a critic can draw out. For example, quote, the rapidly receding vista, the inexplicable disjunctions of scale, the oppressively dark sky, and the strange wraith-like figures of the Muslims fleeing from the storm into the arcade on the left all contribute to a mood of eeriness and disquiet, unquote. Here the critic articulates something you had not, and in doing so he brings into relief aspects of the painting that you might well have felt but did not see, unquote. Heidegger hopes to do the same thing for being generally. By describing the general structure of existence behind any particular entity, we can hopefully start to have a sense of the ground of being that makes it all possible. Of course, there are many entities we could choose to analyze the being of. Heidegger's choice is the entity that we have the greatest access to and closest relationship with, ourselves. Heidegger's term for the kind of entity that humans are is Dasein, and I will later explain exactly what this term means and why we have to use it instead of simply saying man or human beings or something like that. We ourselves, Dasein, are what will be analyzed. By describing our own existence in more explicit and clear ways than ever attempted before in philosophy, we can get a better grasp of what the ground of being is that makes us able to exist in the way that we do. This might sound like circular reasoning. How are we able to study ourselves in our own specific being if we don't know what being itself means in full? Haven't we just presupposed the very thing we're trying to understand? Well, Heidegger makes a surprising claim by agreeing that this investigation is inherently circular, However, this circle is not a vicious one, and he says that rather than escaping the circle, we simply need to enter it in the correct way. This entire text is primarily hermeneutical, which means it is interpretive. The text then follows what, in the study of interpreting literature, history, language, etc., is called the hermeneutic circle. When we come to interpret things, we always do so on the basis of a kind of circularity.
Let's explain exactly what this means. Quote, This presupposing of being has rather the character of taking a look at it beforehand, so that in the light of it the entities presented to us get provisionally articulated in their being. This guiding activity of taking a look at being arises from the average understanding of being in which we always operate, and which in the end belongs to the essential constitution of Dasein itself. Such presupposing has nothing to do with laying down an axiom from which a sequence of propositions is deductively derived. It is quite impossible for there to be any circular argument in formulating the question about the meaning of being, for in answering this question the issue is not one of grounding something by such a derivation, it is rather one of laying bare the grounds for it and exhibiting them." Unquote. If I interpret a work of literature, I might read through it and start with a vague and average understanding of what the work means as a whole, but one passage might present me with particular difficulty. However, I revisit this passage on the basis of what I understand about the rest of the work, and suddenly it makes a little more sense. Of course, now that this one part makes more sense, I have to revise my idea of what everything else in the text means on the basis of its relation to that particular passage. And then my new, more thorough understanding will allow me to have a greater awareness of other individual passages. In general, this is how the hermeneutic circle operates. We interpret individual parts on the basis of the whole, but then also interpret the whole based on the individual parts. By moving back and forth, we eventually move from a vague and average understanding to one that is more rich. We even go through this sort of hermeneutic circle for things that we might consider more objective than literary criticism. For example, any time a new historical document is discovered, we have to understand it on the basis of what we generally know about the surrounding era. But when we understand that historical document to a good degree, it changes how we conceive of the era around it as well, because now we have new data to input in our overall understanding. This is even true for something like learning a new foreign language. For example, if I start to learn Japanese, I will have to start with a very general understanding of what some individual words mean by approximating them in English, even if their nuance and use is slightly different. But then when I become more fluent, I will start to see those words in more sentences and see how they are used in different situations and how they relate to other words. Then I will have a fuller perspective of what those words really mean and how their exact nuance and use might be different to an English translation. But I could never have achieved that without first having a vague and average understanding of what they more or less mean. This is how all interpretive enterprises go, and it is how being in time will also proceed. We'll sketch out our own being only on the basis of the vague and average understanding that we have of what it means to be Dasein, that is, a human being. But then by doing so, we will hopefully be able to understand something about what it means to be more generally. The structure of being and time reflects this circular process. As Michael Wheeler has pointed out in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on Heidegger, being in time structure consists largely of a number of outward spirals, where something is described and interpreted on one level, but then on the basis of that expanded and interpreted on a new, broader, and more fundamental basis. This, of course, means that being in time is extremely rereadable, and in fact to some degree requires us to already understand it before we can really read it, which is part of why I chose to make this video. It should be noted, however, that being in time is ultimately an unfinished work. Originally, it planned to have two main parts, each with three divisions. Namely, it would have had the following structure. Part 1 an attempt to answer the question of being that would have progressed by first analyzing the entity that we all are, which is Dasein, in Division 1. Dasein's being would ultimately be shown to be possible on the basis of time, in Division 2, and then we would extrapolate time to be the general horizon for the question of being, in Division 3. Part 2 would be a so-called destruction of the history of ontology, that is to say, a study of important prior philosophers 
and a critical assessment of how they've either understood or obscured the question of being. Doing this would be much more than just an attempt to gloat and look better than prior thinkers, but rather be an attempt to make the answer of the meaning of being more clear by comparing it with the prior thinkers whose work was essential in getting us to this point. It would have proceeded in a reverse chronological order, first by studying Kant in Division 1, then Descartes in Division 2, and finally Aristotle in Division 3. However, only the first two divisions of Part 1 were ever completed. This means that the ultimate answer to the question of being itself never quite gets resolved in being in time proper. Most of the material that probably would have made up the unwritten portions of being in time ended up materializing in later texts for Heidegger, but the point still stands that being in time itself is unfinished. Part of this is because later on Heidegger became skeptical that time really was the so-called horizon that the question of being could be completely answered on the basis of. But in any case, all of Heidegger's later thought requires us to be familiar with the ground laid by being and time, and much that is discovered along the way will be deeply informative regardless. Part 1. The Interpretation of Dasein in Terms of Temporality and the Explication of Time as the Transcendental Horizon for the Question of Being. Division 1. Preparatory Fundamental Analysis of Dasein Chapter 1. Exposition of the Task of a Preparatory Analysis of Dasein To begin to follow being and time, one word we absolutely have to get clear about the meaning of is Dasein. It is originally a colloquial German term for existence, literally meaning being there or their being, literally. As I said before, Dasein is Heidegger's term for what we all are. But why couldn't he just have said man, human beings, the self, consciousness, or anything like that? The reason is because, according to Heidegger, what we really are is not any one of those things, and thus Dasein is not adequately translated as any of them, even though it has something to do with all of them. How are we to think about ourselves if not in any of these ways? First and foremost, Dasein is an entity and not just a mode of being. If we remember the ontological difference, Dasein is on the same side as things like stones, clouds, money, phosphorus, and not just the side of being itself. However, it would be a big mistake to limit our understanding of Dasein to that of other fields of science. It would be a mistake to see it as merely the corporeal human body or a kind of soul substance. We are not doing biology, so the physical makeup and processes of the human organism are not of interest to us here. We are not doing psychology, so the particular cognitive properties of brains and their relation to our behavior is not of interest to us here. And we are not doing anthropology, so the way that any humans or groups of humans act as individuals or as a culture is not of interest to us here. Dasein is what humans are insofar as they exist, which is prior to all of these. And yet, Dasein is absolutely not the traditional Cartesian view of an I-thing isolated from the material world that simply stands above it like a neutral observer. This, in fact, this is the exact opposite of how Heidegger wants us to understand Dasein. For him, Dasein is something that always comes into being on the basis of a world and others alongside it. Dasein seems to be described in some sections as a kind of shared being that exists at a social public level where it seems like a kind of cultural norm or social construct to use a trendy phrase. But then in other sections it seems to be something that has the most private, solitary experiences that there can be. These are not in conflict. As he will show in the text, Dasein is a kind of thing that, by its very structure, both has a public, shared existence and a private, personal one. So what is it that is so special about Dasein as an entity compared to others? For Heidegger, it is that human beings seem to already have an awareness of what it means to be, as vague and simplified as it may be. 
The fact that we constantly say that things are or aren't something or other is proof of this. And our understanding of being is not just neutral and uninterested. Human beings uniquely are interested in and take a stand on their own existence. Dasein always makes some choice about its own existence. Even if we choose to do nothing and simply go with the flow, that is still a choice we have made. The term Heidegger uses is comportment. Dasein always comports itself in one way or another towards its own being. This is a useful word because it is neutral. It doesn't imply conscious willing, nor mental contemplation, nor active decision making. Our stand on how we are is embodied in how we are and not in how we think. Heidegger's term for a kind of being which is interested in and cares about that very being is existence. The word existence doesn't have the same general meaning that it does in everyday speech in Heidegger's works. For him, existence is a special kind of being, and it is the kind that we as Dasein have. Existence is a kind of being that is aware of and invested in its own being. The movement of philosophy known as existentialism, exemplified by figures like Jean-Paul Sartre, gets its name from this ultimately Heideggerian use of the term existence. Although the importance of this text in French existentialism and phenomenology cannot be overstated, and was in fact the primary reason that Heidegger became famous in the English-speaking world, it should be noted that Heidegger thought Sartre fundamentally misunderstood his work and distanced himself from that movement entirely. Regardless, the importance of the term existence is central for this text. Lots of other things in the world are, but only Dasein exists. As such, we will now examine the being of Dasein very carefully. The main question of being in time is, however, not the meaning of Dasein, but the meaning of being in general. But it is easy to forget this because the two divisions that were completed of the text are the ones that deal with Dasein. While most of the following will discuss Dasein, it is important to remember that we do this in order to spell out the meaning of being generally. With that in mind, we can begin. Chapter 2. Being in the world in general as the basic state of Dasein. In the interest of understanding Dasein, we have to take it all on board. We can't just look at exceptional, unique parts of our existence. The most broad general state that we can describe Dasein as is being in the world. In our average, everyday engagement with everything around us, we exist as being in the world. We should not be misled by the spatial relationship implied in this term. Being in the world has nothing to do with something being physically inside of something else that surrounds it. The in that appears in being in the world is not at all the same as a goldfish being in a bowl, or a chair being in a classroom. Dasein is not a being in the world. Dasein is being in the world. Heidegger says that, it, that the in in being in the world rather means dwelling in the world and belonging to it. We are in our most basic state already engaged with the world, absorbed in it, concerned with it, and not separate from it. This is why Heidegger is deeply skeptical of the Cartesian view that we are, at our core, a free-floating subject that looks out at and takes on the world as an object. Heidegger will take apart this view more fully later on, but he believes that at our most basic state, we are already fundamentally in the world. That is why being in the world does not take after the traditional image of the self as an isolated subject set apart from and encountering the world as an object. He says that certainly we sometimes experience things like this. It is how we experience things in academic, thoughtful exploration in the fields of science and philosophy, for example. And in our personal lives as well, sometimes it feels like we are separate observers that are set apart from everything around us. But Heidegger disagrees with the idea that this is the fundamental way that we exist. He says that the overwhelming majority of the time, we don't have an experience of ourselves as an isolated subject set apart from the world. In fact, we don't usually have an experience of ourselves as a subject at all. 
Think about all the mundane, average, everyday things we do in the course of a day. We spend a lot of our lives doing things like brushing our teeth, changing clothes, unlocking a door with a key, eating breakfast, waiting for a bus or a train, cleaning our house, and so on. If we are successful in these dealings, we won't have an awareness of ourself at all. The basic state of Dasein is a non-reflective, undifferentiated state of very basic relation to everything around us. Of course, we can encounter the world and the things in it in a more analytical and theoretical way, but he says that this is a secondary, derived state from the more primordial relation we have as being in the world, a general state of being where we don't differentiate ourselves from everything around us or set ourselves apart from objects of the world as a subject. Being in the world is a unitary phenomenon. That means that we can't simply break it down into a number of smaller pieces that are then simply added together. However, we do need to understand the idea of the world and of being in more fully if we want to really get it, and thus Dasein, fully in our grasp. Chapter 3. The Worldhood of the World just as we can by no means get at Heidegger's conception of Dasein by simply listing physical features of the human body, we cannot understand the world of being in the world as merely the sum of all the material things that there are in nature. This does not help us get at what he calls the worldhood of the world. However, in order to understand what we do mean by the world, we need to analyze the way that the various things that are in the world do in fact show up and make themselves manifest to Dasein. He introduces two terms to explain how things can show up to us in our various dealings. Vorhandenheit, or presence at hand, and Zuhandenheit, or readiness to hand. His most famous example to make the distinction between these two clear is that of a hammer. We can look at a hammer and consider it as an isolated thing. We can consider its size, its weight, its shape, its materiality, its hammerness, and any other quality that we'd consider part of something like its substance. This reflective, abstracted, removed, uninvolved way of conceptualizing of something is the attitude we have in theoretical activities like science or philosophy. He calls this mode of being presence at hand. But the laborer who actually uses a hammer in his daily life does not conceive of the hammer this way. In fact, he usually does not conceive of the hammer at all. He simply uses it for the task of hammering, and when fully absorbed in that activity, the hammer itself retreats from his experience, and he stops noticing it as a thing in and of itself. And it is not just the hammer. Just as he will not see the hammer as an object, he will not see himself as a subject. This is because the hammerer, involved in this activity, simply exists as being in the world, where he doesn't divide up things in his experience. The way things show up in this involved mode of engagement is called readiness to hand. It's important to note that readiness to hand and presence at hand aren't just properties that things have, nor are they just a kind of coloring that modifies some base experience. They are fundamentally different modes of being, in which things make themselves manifest. These modes of being are constitutive for the thinghood of things themselves. A thing that shows up as ready to hand is a fundamentally different thing than if it shows up as present at hand. Of course, there is one thing that is neither ready to hand nor present at hand, and that is Dasein. Dasein has to stand apart from these two modes as the thing for which they show up. As we discussed in the previous section, the vast majority of our time is spent in this non-reflective, average, everyday state. Heidegger calls it circumspection. Most of our life is spent in this involved circumspection. This means that the majority of the time anything shows up for us, it shows up as zoig, or equipment. Equipment is not something we first conceptualize, but something that we first use, manipulate, involve ourselves with, and so on. Heidegger makes it clear that there really is no such thing as unequipment. equipment 
We could have no way of experiencing hammers as equipment without concepts like nails, boards, buildings, wood, metals, etc. There is always an equipmental totality that allows things to show up as equipment. For example, people in the modern Western world have no special awareness of chairs when they sit down in them. But if someone from ancient Japan were to see a chair, they would in no way be able to experience it as a chair because there would be no context for chairs in their society. They would only come to experience it as a kind of oddly shaped hunk of wood. Things show up as ready to hand on the basis of there being a full context for them to do so in. Of course, we normally are not aware of this. When I am typing an email to my manager at work, I don't notice the keyboard as a keyboard, but I simply use it without reflection or attention. Indeed, the more absorbed I am in writing the email, the less I even divide something called a keyboard out of the totality of my experience. However, what happens when a key stops working? Suddenly, I'm cognizant of the keyboard in its thinghood. I don't yet completely experience it as purely present at hand, but I am no longer using it smoothly and without interruption. Heidegger calls this in-between state unreadiness to hand. Now, I may just press the key a few more times until it fixes itself and then return to typing an email as usual and return to my involved circumspection. But suppose the key completely stops responding, and then another one does, and then the whole keyboard stops responding. Suddenly I look for a solution by checking the wires, and so on. When I do this, I gradually become aware that the keyboard is a material thing with its own properties, the computer that it is connected to is a material thing with its own properties, that I am using it to make words appear on a screen, that I'm doing that so that I can send an email to my manager, that I'm trying to send an email in order to be a responsible employee, and so on. That last one, doing it in order to be a responsible employee, is really the most important. In Heidegger's terminology, it's called a for the sake of which, and the for the sake of which that we have determines our whole orientation, and thus the whole way everything gets its role assigned in our experience of the world. And what is this world in this case? The world is exactly what gets lit up by a disturbance like the above. The relation of the keyboard to the computer, the computer to the email, the email to the manager, the manager to our status as an employee, and so on. When something gets interrupted like this, we get a glimpse of the full structure of contexts that allow things to show up as ready to hand for our various dealings. This is the world, and it is ultimately conditioned by our for the sake of which. Dasein has always assigned itself some for the sake of which or another, whether it does so consciously or not. This for the sake of which is not something that can be grasped as an entity, however. It is rather the basis that allows entities to manifest themselves in the first place. This is a very different way of conceiving of the world and the ontology of the things in it than we see in most of the Western tradition. In order to call attention to just how different it is, and to make his claims more clear, Heidegger now takes time to contrast his view with the flagship example of traditional Western ontology, René Descartes. Let's consider the traditional Cartesian view of the world, which has become ingrained in much of Western philosophy and science. For Descartes, there are certain objective things in the world that have their own substance which is independent of our interests and designs. For example, a hammer has a specific substance or thinghood based on objective features like the physical space it takes up, the material it is made out of, its size, shape, and weight, etc. Eventually, we would start to see things like hammers on the basis of how we can pragmatically use them. But this only occurs on the basis of this most fundamental scientific awareness, such as Descartes' view. We can essentially summarize the difference in the two views with Heidegger's terminology. For Descartes, we begin with the present at hand and get to the ready to hand only by becoming more familiar with the thing and starting to ignore its more objective, scientific properties. Heidegger's view is the exact opposite. 
For him, we begin first and foremost with the ready to hand, and get to the present at hand by stripping away all of our various involvements with the thing, and the lived worldly context in which it first occurs to us. We have to basically wrench the thing out of the worldly context that it emerges in and free it for contemplation as an entity that is free-floating and able to be isolated in its substance. So it is clear that these two views are diametrically opposed. That said, both of them appear coherent and comprehensible at first glance. So on the basis of what should we believe Heidegger's account over Descartes? Heidegger's argument for why Descartes' view should be rejected is brief and murky, as it would most likely have been fleshed out more fully in the unwritten second half of Being in Time during the so-called destruction of Western ontology. But I will try to summarize his argument, paraphrasing Michael Wheeler. While we conceivably can get to the present at hand by de-worlding and abstracting the ready to hand, we can't get to something like the ready to hand from the present at hand in any way that makes sense. The best way to do that seems to be adding a bunch of value judgments to something present at hand, but we would have to add on values to it like sufficiently heavy or useful in X context. But these sorts of values themselves are present at hand structures because they are abstracted out of our lived involved circumspection. In other words, you simply add more present at hand structures onto something that is already present at hand, and it is hard to see how this could result in readiness to hand. What Descartes did get right, according to Heidegger, was that spatiality is essential for entities to show up in the world, including Dasein itself. After all, being in the world seems to be a phrase that implies a spatial relationship. But for Heidegger, where Descartes erred was in viewing this spatiality in a purely physical, mathematical sense. He defined the real of the material world as something that has extension, which is to say takes up space. But Heidegger argues that this kind of metrical, scientific, taking up space that Descartes has in mind is an abstraction out of a more primordial kind of spatiality. But what else could space mean if not physical location and extension? First, a basic observation. Phenomenal closeness and distance are very different from physical closeness and distance. For a good example, let's say that I am wearing glasses and looking at a painting in an art gallery. The glasses will be physically much closer to me than the painting, but in terms of which of the two things are more central to my experience, and thus closer in terms of what stands out most to me, it is the painting by far. In fact, the better a pair of glasses is, the less I will experience them at all. If I talk to my friend on the phone, my friend who I am invested in is much more a part of my being than the inert phone in my hand. If I'm walking to my favorite restaurant, I'm thinking more about the sandwich I will eat than the sidewalk that my feet are actually touching. We could bring up many more examples. Indeed, our modern world with computers and smartphones has only made it easier and easier to have physically far things be close to us in non-physical ways. Heidegger himself noticed this all the way back in 1927 when this was written. Quote, In Dasein, there lies an essential tendency towards closeness. All the ways in which we speed things up, as we are more or less compelled to do today, push us on towards the conquest of remoteness. With the radio, for example, Dasein has so expanded its everyday environment that it has accomplished a deseverance of the world, a deseverance which, in its meaning for Dasein, cannot yet be visualized." Unquote. So this is the first and most important thing to remember. What is closest to us is not necessarily what is physically near. But what is this closeness, if not physical location, relative to our body? It is the phenomenal closeness and distance that Dasein assigns to things that are ready to hand. Remember, Dasein has a certain for the sake of which that orients Dasein and gives it direction, and thus decrees how the world we dwell in appears to us. And in doing so, it has to give everything a range of closeness or distance to us. Some things have to matter to us more than others, or have more of a central use than another, and so on. 
all equipment has a region in the equipmental totality that Dasein is involved in. So far, this shouldn't be very controversial. Most people would agree that we can feel like things far away from us are more important and thus closer than things that are near. In fact, it's very topical today when we call attention to how young people are becoming so isolated because all their closest friends are online and thus so physically far away from them. You've seen videos about this. However, Heidegger makes a more radical extrapolation. He doesn't think that we just feel like they're closer to us and thus delude ourselves to not notice the physical distance, which is more real. He actually claims that the whole idea of physical closeness and distance is a latter phenomenon that is dependent on this more foundational and prior phenomenal experience of closeness and distance. Quote, a three-dimensional multiplicity of possible positions which gets filled up with things present at hand is never proximally given. This dimensionality of space is still veiled in the spatiality of the ready-to-hand. The above is what is on the ceiling. The below is what is on the floor. The behind is what is at the door. All wares are discovered and circumspectively interpreted. As we go our ways in everyday dealings, they are not ascertained and cataloged by the observational measurement of space. Quote, Though these estimates may be imprecise and variable if we try to compute them, in the everydayness of Dasein they have their own definiteness, which is thoroughly intelligible. We say that to go over yonder is a good walk, a stone's throw, or as long as it takes to smoke a pipe. These measures express not only that they are not intended to measure anything, but also that the remoteness here estimated belongs to some entity to which one goes with concernful circumspection, unquote. That is to say, even being able to say something like two kilometers away, above, or inside of, is a latter phenomenon derived from a lived, involved understanding of spatiality like within walking distance, on the ceiling, available when I reach in my wallet, and so on. Even to orient ourselves in terms of something like left and right requires us first to be in a world. We might call these latter modes subjective, but for Heidegger, these are the most real and primary ways we encounter entities within the world. That's not to say that scientific knowledge based on measurements and so on is somehow a distortion. By no means, but this data is a latter phenomenon that is abstracted and de-worlded. One question that goes more or less unanswered in this section is how we interpret the fact that we, as Dasein, always seem to be in a physical body. He references it only obliquely when discussing the directions of right and left as we experience them. Quote, Dasein's spatialization in its bodily nature is likewise marked out in accordance with these directions. This bodily nature hides a whole problematic of its own, though we shall not treat it here. Unquote. Some later phenomenologists like Maurice Merleau-Ponty have taken up the nature of the body in a way that is influenced by Heidegger, but it remains unclear what exactly the problematic of Dasein's bodily nature would have been from a purely Heideggerian perspective. Chapter 4. Being in the world as being with and being oneself, the they. We have so far defined Dasein in its average everydayness as being in the world. But we know that in our daily lives, we consider ourselves to be Dasein. Who is Dasein in its average everydayness? How does this being in the world relate to the way we tend to refer to Dasein as an I or a subject? Traditionally, we think of the self or I as being some kernel that stays the same beneath a constantly shifting manifold of experience and relates to that manifold in some way. But this is the I as presence at hand, not as existence. It doesn't do full justice to the phenomenal experience of Dasein. As sketched out above, Dasein always comes into existence along with a world. It is never a free-floating subject that is isolated and cut off from everything around it. And one element of that world is the presence of others, that is, other Daseins. <laughs> 
even in the most basic relation I have to equipment before me, I have an awareness of others. Even something simple like the way equipment shows up for us depends on this. The carpenter who is engaged in hammering knows that he is working on a house that others will live in. The tailor who sews a suit knows that it is a suit that an other will wear. And this presence of others is not just tacked on to our base experience. To quote Heidegger directly, quote, When, for example, we walk along the edge of a field, but outside it, the field shows itself as belonging to such and such a person, and decently kept up by him. The book we have used was bought at so-and-so's shop and given by such and such a person and so forth. The boat anchored at the shore is assigned in its being in itself to an acquaintance who undertakes voyages with it. But even if it is a boat which is strange to us, it is still indicative of others. The others who are thus encountered in a ready-to-hand environmental context of equipment are not somehow added on in thought to some thing which is proximally just present at hand. Such things are encountered from out of the world in which they are ready to hand for others, a world which is always mine too in advance." Unquote. That is, we encounter things as ready to hand not solely because of our own designs and interests, but because we in some way or other relate ourselves to other designs. For example, a hammer is ready to hand, in large part because we are in a culture of fellow hammer users that we more or less conform to. This is because, as Dasein is being in the world, it is also being with. The world that we encounter equipment in is a social one, which always already has others in it. However, we should not understand being with as merely the addition of a number of individual subjects existing alongside each other. In fact, the experience of subjects at all and the number of individual subjects in a given state of affairs is grounded on being with, not the other way around. It is only on the basis of being with that we come to have any awareness of ourself as a self. We always stand in some relationship with others, even when we are alone, we never fully lack an awareness of others. Our awareness of what it means to be ourself is only possible on the basis that we will somehow or another relate to others, even if the way we relate to them is by abandoning them all and going to live alone in a cabin in the woods, for example. Heidegger's term for this way that other Daseins always matter to us in some way or another, and we always have some attitude towards them, is solicitude. We can love people, hate them, envy them, miss them, or be flatly indifferent to them. All are forms of solicitude. In a sense, this dissolves the whole problem of other minds that many philosophers have struggled with. We might start to wonder how we can really know that there are other beings around me who think and feel like I do, and are not just zombies or automatons that convincingly appear to be conscious in the same way I am. This problem, however, only occurs if we think of ourselves as an isolated I-thing that is cut off from and encountering a bunch of other isolated I-things. And that is a present-at-hand abstraction, derived from the way we actually exist in our everyday being in the world. In being with, we already have access to others, along with the access we have to ourselves, via our shared activities and involvements. We only get into a mindset where we can entertain this idea of others being automatons or zombies if something has broken down and gone awry in our daily being with. With the above, it goes to show that, in its average everydayness, Dasein is not just a kind of isolated subject cut off from and observing things around it. Dasein is being in the world and comes into existence always already involved with a world, so it is being with and comes into existence always already with some solicitude towards other Daseins. But this still hasn't necessarily answered the question, who is Dasein in its average everydayness? Heidegger makes a surprising claim. Dasein is, in its average everydayness, by and large, not itself. It is what he calls the they. The they is the most common translation, and I will continue to use it, but it has a bit of a misleading air. 
It sounds as if he is describing something sinister, where we become a thoughtless conformist drone who is blinded and by and crushed by the weight of an oppressive system that tries to keep us from becoming our true self. This is definitely not the impression that Heidegger wants us to have with reading this term. The original German term is Das Mann, which could also be translated as Hubert L. Dreyfus does as the one. This doesn't mean the one in the sense of some mystical oneness of all things, but one in the very prosaic sense of what one does or what one is to do. In German, this is an especially common term. In English, when giving directions, advice, or otherwise speaking about general behavior, we usually use the word you to stand for a neutral, interchangeable subject. For example, we say, you walk to the end of the block and take a left. You pronounce Gloucester as Gloucester. You're not supposed to put your elbows on the table, and so on. Saying one is not supposed to put one's elbows on the table sounds very formal in English, but in German, casual speech uses one in just the way that English speakers use you. For example, even when just giving directions, they would say one walks to the end of the block and takes a left. In the same way, we would say you walk to the end of the block and take a left. This is the sense of das Mann, or the they. The they is, most broadly speaking, those whom we do not distinguish ourselves from. Even if we think of ourselves as individualists or people with unusual lifestyles, if we are honest about our average everydayness, the vast majority of it is spent doing things according to the rules. We cook our food according to the recipe. We cross the street when the light shines a certain way. We wear the same kind of clothes as those expected by others in our profession, and so on. We do as they do, but the they is never a phenomenon of some definite group of individuals. To quote Heidegger, quote, These others, moreover, are not definite others. On the contrary, any other can represent them. What is decisive is just that inconspicuous domination by others, which has already been taken over unawares from Dasein as being with. One belongs to the others oneself and enhances their power. The others whom one thus designates in order to cover up the fact of one's belonging to them, essentially oneself, are those who proximately and for the most part are there in every day being with one another. The who is not this one, not that one, not oneself, not some people, and not the sum of them all. The who is the neuter, the they, unquote. This is a being with where our Dasein is dissolved into that of others and individual subjects recede more and more. See the following evocative passage, quote, In utilizing public means of transport and in making use of information services such as the newspaper, every other is like the next. This being with one another dissolves one's own Dasein completely into the kind of being of the others, and in such a way, indeed, that the others, as distinguishable and explicit, vanish more and more. In this inconspicuousness and unascertainability, the real dictatorship of the they is unfolded. We take pleasure and enjoy ourselves as they take pleasure. We read, see, and judge about literature and art as they see and judge. Likewise, we shrink back from the great mass as they shrink back. We find shocking what they find shocking. The they, which is nothing definite and which all are, though not as the sum, prescribes the kind of being of everydayness. Unquote. In general, the they consists of a kind of averaging or leveling down. Quote, In this averageness, with which it prescribes what can and may be ventured, it keeps watch over everything exceptional that thrusts itself to the fore. Every kind of priority gets noiselessly suppressed. Overnight, everything that is primordial gets glossed over as something that has long been well known. Everything gained by a struggle becomes just something to be manipulated. Every secret loses its force. This care of averageness reveals, in turn, an essential tendency of Dasein, which we call the leveling down of all possibilities of being. He calls this the publicness of Dasein. Dasein, in its average everydayness, disburdens itself of having to take control of its own decisions and agency. Quote, 
The they is there alongside everywhere, but in such a manner that it has always stolen away whenever Dasein presses for a decision. Yet because the they presents every judgment and decision as its own, it deprives the particular Dasein of its answerability. The they can, as it were, manage to have them constantly invoking it. It can be answerable for everything most easily, because it is not someone who needs to vouch for anything. It was always the they who did it, and yet it can be said that it has been no one. In Dasein's everydayness, the agency through which most things come about is one of which we must say that it was no one. Unquote. Dasein, the majority of the time, is the they and has already surrendered itself over to it. Now, it should be specified that this in no way means that Dasein stops existing. But like Dasein, the they is never something present at hand and is by no means something like a universal subject. Dasein can either lose itself to the they and remain engaged with the public world, never really taking hold of itself and having any awareness of its own agency and identity. Heidegger calls this mode of being inauthenticity, or it can take back control of itself from the they, recognize its own individuality, and be in charge of its own destiny. He calls this authenticity. The primary focus of Division 1 is on Dasein in its inauthentic state, where it exists in a kind of average everydayness and doesn't really come to terms with itself as itself. Division 2 focuses more on authentic Dasein, where Dasein comes out of its everyday existence and starts to come to terms with its real selfhood and the responsibility as such that it uniquely possesses. Now, I want to make one point very abundantly clear as generations have misunderstood this text by not grasping this. There is absolutely no sense of morality in this distinction of authentic and inauthentic Dasein. Many have somehow read this section as a call for us to be ourselves and not get crushed by conformity. It is hard not to get swept up in that feeling when reading the most evocative passages of this section. But for Heidegger, being the inauthentic they-self is simply a way that Dasein can be, and in fact it is a way that Dasein must be at least sometimes. It is a part of Dasein's structure to find itself lost in the they, and also to sometimes reach out from it and become itself. A Dasein that only existed in a fully authentic state would be as incomplete as one that only existed in its inauthentic state. It is especially easy to get mistaken on this, since the words authentic and inauthentic have such a moral air in English. But we need to take these terms in the most literal etymological sense. Just like the original Eigentlichkeit and Uneigentlichkeit in German, authentic has the root auto. It literally means something like with self, and inauthentic something like without self. This is how we should take these divisions. Dasein is authentic when it has a conception of itself, and is inauthentic when it does not, and there is no moral judgment here about one being the right way to be. It's simply a description of ways that Dasein is from a phenomenological point of view. And that helps us bring a view of exactly who Dasein is into greater view. In its average everydayness, it is largely the they, and has already given itself over to it. We don't have a full grasp of who it is in its authentic mode until Division 2, but much of the groundwork to understand that has to be accomplished in the next chapters. Chapter 5. Being in as such. We know that Dasein, in its average everydayness, is being in the world, and have defined the world and the who of Dasein to a suitable degree for the time being. Now we have to really understand the structure of the being in part. This chapter is very long, complex, and difficult, but it is also the most important of Division 1 and possibly of the entire text. We will have to proceed very carefully and thoroughly. It might seem like we are moving closer to the real nature of Dasein, and this is true in a way, but Heidegger now takes pains to make it clear how his fundamental ontology is different from other philosophers in the Western tradition. Namely, his involves the concept of what he calls equiprimordiality. This means that multiple characteristics can be equally basic and primal, 
Both are essential to the phenomenon. Neither are more basic than the other, or can be reduced to something else more basic, and both can only be understood in relation to the other. For Heidegger, some phenomena may simply be this way at their core. For whatever reason, the history of Western ontology has been uncomfortable with this. Quote, Consequently, if we inquire about being in as our theme, we cannot indeed consent to nullify the primordial character of this phenomenon by deriving it from others. That is to say, by an inappropriate analysis in the sense of dissolving or breaking up. But the fact that something primordial is underivable does not rule out the possibility that a multiplicity of characteristics of being may be constitutive for it. If these show themselves, then existentially they are equiprimordial. The phenomenon of the equiprimordiality of constitutive items has often been disregarded in ontology because of a methodologically unrestrained tendency to derive everything and anything from some simple primal ground. Unquote. We've already seen that in the phenomenon of being in the world, Dasein and the world are both equiprimordial. That is to say, although we can analyze both of them on their own, there cannot be a world without Dasein, and there cannot be Dasein without a world. But now we have to explain the exact relationship that happens in the phenomenon of being in. It is certainly nothing like one isolated present-at-hand subject in Dasein encountering another isolated present-at-hand object in the world. Instead, Heidegger focuses on three parts of the being-in structure, all of which are equiprimordial for it. Those are Befindlichkeit, or disposedness, Verständnis, or understanding, and Rede, or discourse. Each one will have to be analyzed in turn. To back up, let's remember exactly what the etymology of Dasein is. Their being. Dasein is a being there. The etymology that ties Dasein to their is very important and would be more obvious in the original German. As we discussed, Dasein is being in the world. And in order for the world to appear around it, Dasein is oriented in some way or another. It has a for the sake of which that allows certain things to appear as ready to hand for it, and out of a network of involvements, there is some nexus carved out for it. But the web of relations doesn't scale out forever. It is delimited in some way or another by our for the sake of which. And this is what Heidegger calls our there. A there is disclosed for us. Dasein is the disclosedness of its there. In this there, Dasein is being there, and one of the things that is constitutive for this there is what is usually translated as state of mind, but I will call disposedness, following another tradition of translation. Normally, I will go with the most common terms of translation, even if they can be somewhat misleading, but I think that state of mind is particularly pernicious. The reason is that the original term being translated here is Befindlichkeit in the German, which literally means something like how one finds oneself. State of mind sounds too cerebral and interior for what Befindlichkeit really entails. It is a particular affect of Dasein that allows it to have any mood or feeling. As a phenomenon, it is very much before all cognizing and mental activity. Therefore, I will continue to translate Befindlichkeit as disposedness, but if you see someone talking about being in time and referring to state of mind, it's the same thing. A disposedness is essentially the ground for there to be any kind of mood or Stimmung in the original German. In the German, this word Stimmung also means tone, and this is a good way to think of it. Dasein is always in some mood or another. It is attuned to the world in one way or another. And we should think of this as more broadly than just the simple feelings in a child's picture book, like happy, sad, angry, and so on. It is closer to think of it as something like the mood of a crowd, of an era in time, of a city, of a film or painting, and so on. But of course feelings like happiness, sadness, fear, and so on are part of moods. Dasein is always in a mood. And the way we say this is important. We speak of being in a mood, not of the mood being in us. That is because of the special way that moods show up to us existentially. Quote, 
From what has been said, we can already see that a disposedness is very remote from anything like coming across a psychical condition by the kind of apprehending which first turns around and then back. Indeed, it is so far from this that only because the there has already been disclosed in a disposedness can imminent reflection come across experiences at all. The bare mood discloses the there more primordially, but correspondingly, it closes it off more stubbornly than any not perceiving. This is shown by bad moods. In these, Dasein becomes blind to itself. The environment with which it is concerned veils itself. The circumspection of concern gets led astray. Disposednesses are so far from being reflected upon that precisely what they do is to assail Dasein in its unreflecting devotion to the world, with which it is concerned and on which it expends itself. A mood assails us. It comes neither from outside nor from inside, but arises out of being in the world, as a way of such being. For Heidegger, Moods are far from just a kind of coloring or tent over an objective world that is out there. The mood that Dasein is in fundamentally changes how things show up in the world for it. Our there is conditioned by our mood. The world and our there is very different when we are elated, when we are angry, when we are afraid, when we are bored, and so on. Dasein is always in some mood or another. It cannot get outside of being in a mood because it's there is disclosed to it on the basis of a mood. Even the cool-headed, objective, and impartial stance of the scientists is a kind of mood. A state of mind and with it a mood is one of the things that is constitutive for the disclosure of a there, and it is only on the basis of this disclosure that there is anything like experience in the first place. Remember that the term befindlichkeit means how one finds oneself. And the word find here is particularly important. This is because Dasein does not ever first come into the world neutrally and view it from an uninvolved stance. Dasein is always already delivered over to some way of being open to the world or another, and thus always finds itself being involved in some way or another. It is always already found itself there. Heidegger calls this Geworfenheit, or thrownness. Dasein is always thrown into the world in one way or another, and always finds itself already having arrived into its circumstances. Disposedness is the clearest way in which we can understand this thrownness. However, disposedness is not the only thing that is constitutive for disclosure of the there, and thus for the world, for being with, and for Dasein's existence. Equiprimordial with disposedness is understanding. This section is embedded in the general analytic of being in, which masks how important it really is. Michael Gelvin calls attention to this section as one of the most important in the whole text and as being essential to comprehending everything in the text afterwards. So while we should not forget that we are talking about one of the three equiprimordial characteristics of being in, and we need to spend a lot of time realizing its full implications. I follow Gelvin very closely in this section. Dasein always has some sort of understanding. However, Understanding does not merely mean thinking or any other kind of mental cognitive activity. All mental functioning like that is a latter phenomenon that only appears on the basis of understanding. Understanding is a more primordial phenomenon where Dasein's existence structure is revealed. It does this by disclosing Dasein's possibilities. To get a sense of this, let's review some of the groundwork already laid out. The most immediate awareness we have of the world and the things in it is not a scientific, disinterested, dispassionate apprehending of present-at-hand things. We first encounter the world as ready-to-hand equipment. That is to say, we encounter it on the basis of how we can use it. We encounter things on the basis of their usability, serviceability, capacity to do something, and so on. But think about these words usability, serviceability, capacity, 
we can only recognize something as being useful, serviceable, or capable on the basis of some plan or possibility that is laid out before us in advance, even if we are not consciously aware of it. Possibility is the necessary condition for things to show up as ready to hand. The world gains significance on the basis of something I plan to do or have the ability to do, or alternatively not to do. Even the present at hand, where we experience things in their bare thinghood, appears as such for a certain purpose, like contemplation, gaining of knowledge, progress in science, and so on. And just as Dasein is always in some disposedness or another, and is never just neutrally apprehending the world and waiting to make a judgment on it, Dasein has also always already seized some possibilities and not others. Possibilities are never just free-floating and disconnected from experience. All things occur against an unspoken background of possibilities. This overwhelming priority of possibility is essential for understanding being and time. For Heidegger, the possible is always prior to the actual, and the actual always depends on the possible. This is actually a pretty strange claim from the perspective of traditional Western philosophy and science. The more common view that most hold is that the possible is dependent on the actual. After all, if we think about if something is possible or not, the first thing we tend to look at is the actual relevant states of affairs and try to extrapolate on the basis of those. But Heidegger says that this ignores the most fundamental step. In order to look at what is actual, before us, we first need possibilities. He claims that the world does not first present itself to us as actual things that are indifferent to us. Rather, the world first presents itself to us as a breadth of possibilities. And he claims that this awareness of our possibilities is foundational to the world appearing to us at all. Our possibility to exist in some way or another comes before the actuality of anything in our world. Remember how, in the discussion of the world, he spelled out that it is the for the sake of which that determines the significance everything in the world has and thus allows things to show up in the first place? And what is a for the sake of which but a possible way to be? It is a possibility. That, of being that Dasein has seized on. There aren't many explicit arguments in the text for why possibility precedes actuality or facthood, as this is primarily a phenomenological account rather than a logical argument. However, Michael Gelvin calls attention to how we might extrapolate them. Even when we think of the most rational and logical things, they are ultimately based on a possibility of some kind. For example, why is, the, is it the case that something cannot be both A and not A, i.e. for it to both be raining and not raining? Because I cannot picture both things being true at once. But ultimately, this is a statement of what is possible for us. I cannot picture them both. I do not have the possibility to picture them both. Why is it the case that a square must have four corners? Because I cannot fathom a square that does not have four corners. I do not have the possibility to fathom a square with four corners. Heidegger thus believes that even basic logic like this is ultimately something we abstract from an awareness of our own possibilities that is more foundational. If Dasein comes to be by understanding and having an awareness of its own possibilities, there is an important takeaway. Dasein is always, to some degree, more than what it is. What does this mean? Well, in order to have an awareness of my possibilities, I have to, in a sense, reach out of what I actually am at the moment. Heidegger calls this projection. It is not to be confused with the concept of psychological projection, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about. In Heidegger's sense, projection is part of Dasein because Dasein has to project itself out into its possibilities. 
In order to conceive of your possibilities, you have to see yourself as more than you are right now. You have to consider the future. You have to consider things outside of you. You have to consider yourself changing in some way. You have to consider the equipment in the world and how you will use it and so on. He claims then, famously, that Dasein is always more than what it factually is, but is never more than what it factically is. Factically meaning a sort of fact from an existential point of view. That is to say, Dasein is more than just a corporeal body with a central nervous system, neurons firing in the brain, cell processes, and so on, because it always reaches out past itself to conceive of its possibilities. But it is never more than the projection it has onto its own possibilities with regard to its there. That is what Dasein is. Something very important comes to light here. We can come to know and conceive of our possibilities, not because they enter into our minds as something to consider. We come to know our possibilities because we are our possibilities. This actually solves a big problem in epistemology. The traditional problem is, how can we come to conceive of possibilities? Conceiving of what is possible, but not yet, or even not ever actual, is a big part of the human cognitive experience. Yet how can we come to conceptualize and direct our cognitive activity towards something that is not actual? It doesn't make sense for possibilities to come from objects of our experience, because what we experience is always actual and never just possible. But if something comes from our mind and doesn't have any relation to objects of experience, it is hard to see how that could count as knowledge at all, and therefore how we could judge some things to be possible and others not to be. For Heidegger, the above problem occurs because the order is all wrong. Possibilities are not things that we later derive from experience and from thinking. They are part of our existence. Possibilities are there from the very beginning and are part of who we are. We don't need to create them out of experience or out of cognition. They are already there. Rather, it is only because there are possibilities, or perhaps more accurately, because we are possibilities, that things like experience and cognition even come into being. This is a very radical idea because it essentially collapses epistemology, the study of how we come to know things and determine them as true or false, into ontology, the study of what there is. Traditionally, there is a problem of philosophers having to explain how pure reason relates to the kind of lived experience we have with our senses. For Heidegger, there was never a conflict between these two in the first place, because there is no such thing as purely cognitive knowing cut off from our experience. While Heidegger essentially does his best to dissolve the boundary between pure cognitive activity and lived existence, there is still a bit more to our understanding than merely seizing on possibilities. It is true that our understanding arises out of our existence structure. That is to say, that in our existence we are a number of possibilities, and it is by coming to terms with them that we have an understanding in the more dispassionate, conceptual way that we typically think of. But that might seem like an incomplete explanation, and that is because it is. He now calls attention to how along with understanding comes interpretation. Do remember, however, that interpretation is not something extra added on top of understanding. It is part of the same general process. The German word for interpretation, Auslegung, literally means a laying out. And this is important. It implies that you already have the stuff before you. You can only lay out something that is already there in some way or another. When we interpret, we aren't creating something new out of thin air. We're rather bringing what is already there into focus. And by interpreting, he doesn't mean solely the kind of thing that goes on about works of art or historical texts or whatever. Whenever we encounter anything in the world, we take it as something. Interpretation is far from a merely heady, intellectual activity. When we take something as something, what we are really doing is just making clear our relation to that thing. For example, I can take a hammer as a hammer because it is of a certain use to me, 
that of hammering on things in order to make them stay fixed in place. If it cannot do this, it is not a hammer. However, something can only show up as that thing if it is already ready to hand. I can only take a hammer as a hammer if I'm in a world where hammers are used and I'm familiar with how to use them. This, of course, means that interpretation can only happen against a background of something that is already there. Heidegger calls this the for structure. In short, in any interpretation, we already have some context for encountering something, some direction to how we take it in, and some vague idea of how to make sense of it. This process of interpretation happens any time we take something as something. But what is important to remember is that none of this is purely cognitive or conceptual. All this taking as comes out of Dasein's involvement with and use of the ready to hand. Interpretation is simply this as structure becoming more explicit. Michael Gelvin points out the example of a kiss between two lovers. How do we interpret the kiss? as an expression of affection, but there's nothing in the kiss itself that we can interpret affection from in isolation. It only comes to have meaning on the basis of the affection already being there. From the phenomenon of interpretation, we also ultimately get the phenomenon of meaning. A pen as a pen has to be able to be used for writing. A broom as a broom has to be able to be used for sweeping. This is the meaning of those items. Note, however, that, this, that these meanings are arrived at based on the potential these things have to be used, and that means that ultimately, their meaning does not lie in the things themselves, nor in the words we use to refer to them. Their meaning ultimately lies in Dasein, as Dasein is the one who makes use of them. The meaning of things is a part of being in the world. Dasein is somehow familiar with the world, and if so required, can make explicit the way in which the world is available to it, via interpretation. Meaning is thus a mode of being in the world. Meaning only exists in Dasein, and Dasein can never be totally outside the realm of meaning. Other entities in the world might be devoid of meaning, but never Dasein. Dasein is always the ground for its own meaning. Even something like propositional logic is gr originally grounded in our everyday as structure. For example, to follow Gelvin's example again, we might have a proposition like, the hammer is too heavy. When I say the hammer is too heavy, I am indeed calling attention to the hammer as a hammer, but I'm not calling attention to the concept of a hammer, but the hammer itself. This is because the hammer itself is my use of it. My use of it is the primary meaning of it. I'm also pointing out a, particularly, a particular property of it, its heaviness, and I do it in order to communicate to another our shared comportment and our relation to the ready to hand. But none of this is the strict theory of propositional logic where I attach the independent idea of hammerness to the independent idea of heaviness. This kind of propositional logic is derivative of the worldly nature of the assertion, like most science in theory is. It is a present-at-hand derivation from the original ready-to-hand assertion. By the way, all of this applies for the entire text of being in time itself. This text is, if we remember, fundamentally interpretive. But in interpreting, we aren't inventing something out of nowhere. The structure of being is already there, and we already have some dim awareness of it. The purpose of being time is to make this understanding more clear and articulated, not to invent it out of thin air. Now, to remind ourselves of where we are in the analysis of being in, understanding, and with it projection of possibilities, interpretation, and meaning, is equiprimordial with disposedness in the disclosure of the there of Dasein. But there is one other thing that is equiprimordial with them, and that is Rede, or discourse. The section on discourse is often quite difficult, but it is clearly important since it is a fundamental part of being in. The word Rede literally means something like speech or talking, but what Heidegger has in mind is something more fundamental than language. Discourse is, for him, what has to first be there to make language possible. 
Hubert L. Dreyfus, who I will refer to a lot in this summary, prefers to translate it as telling, but in a more general sense than just speaking. Think of telling the time, for example. Most broadly put, discourse is the grounds for there to be any kind of intelligibility. I'd like to begin explaining it by an example that I've been struck by during my learning of Japanese as a foreign language. In English, like many other languages, we use the words thunder and lightning to explain the phenomenon of streaks of light and booming noises that occurs during rainstorms. Lightning refers to the phenomenon of light streaks flashing and thunder to the loud noises that follow them. In Japanese, on the other hand, the word used to generally refer to the phenomenon is kaminari, which is a word for a singular phenomenon, lightning and thunder. This makes sense, of course. Lightning and thunder always follow each other, so why not refer to both of them with a single word? But it seems that in English, we take it as two phenomena that always follow each other, a light phenomenon that ends and a separate sound phenomenon that nevertheless always follows it. In Japanese, on the other hand, we take it as a single phenomenon with a light component and a sound component that do not overlap but nevertheless are connected as a single process. Heidegger explains this as the world being articulated. When we come to exist in the world, we are able to take certain entities as entities. We speak meaningfully of individual things like hammers, nails, boards, and so on in the midst of our various involvements. When we use something like a hammer for hammering, we're seizing on one of the ways it becomes significant to us, namely its possibility to push nails into things. Dasein is thrown into a world that is already articulated into certain nodes of signification, on the basis of which we can interact with and involve ourselves with various dealings and with other Daseins around us. Of course, these will vary as much as anything else that is culturally or societally dependent for Dasein. That is why we sometimes see discrepancies like the difference in the way that English speakers and Japanese speakers articulate and carve up the lightning and thunder phenomenon. What is important for Heidegger, however, is that discourse, the way the world becomes intelligible to us, is prior to language. We come to use language and words to express the articulated significance of the world to other Daseins. Discourse is a more broad and immediate thing than language. As Hubert L. Dreyfus says, a surgeon does not have words for all the ways he cuts, nor does a chess master have words for all the patterns of a game he can recognize and respond to. The significance that emerges in discourse is what allows the world to first have a structure that can become reflected in language. To quote Heidegger directly, quote, The intelligibility of being in the world, an intelligibility which goes with a disposedness, expresses itself as discourse. The totality of significations of intelligibility is put into words. To significations, words accrue, but word things do not get supplied with significations. Unquote. As Michael Galvin puts it, the most basic foundation of language is thus not grammar or logic. It is discourse. Discourse is what allows things to come to us as intelligible, and they always do. But in order for us to express ourselves in discourse and, intellig and make clear the intelligibility of the world, it has to be a two-way street. Discourse requires us to be open to understanding the significance of the world in a particular way, and much of that consists in hearing, listening, and being silent. Quote, Hearing is constitutive for discourse, and just as linguistic utterance is based on discourse, so is acoustic perception on hearing. Listening, too, is Dasein's existential way of being open as being with for others. Indeed, hearing constitutes the primary and authentic way in which Dasein is open for its own most potentiality for being, as in hearing the voice of the friend whom every Dasein carries with it. Dasein hears because it understands. As a being in the world with others, a being which understands, Dasein is enthralled to Dasein with and to itself, and in this thraldom it belongs to these." Unquote. But just as we never see pure visual data, 
neither do we ever simply hear pure sound tones. Quote, it is on the basis of this potentiality for hearing, which is existentially primary, that anything like hearkening becomes possible. Hearkening is phenomenally still more primordial than what is defined in the first instance as hearing in psychology, the sensing of tones and the perception of sounds. Hearkening, too, has the kind of being of the hearing which understands. What we first hear is never noises or complexes of sounds, but the creaking wagon, the motorcycle. We hear the column on the march, the north wind, the woodpecker tapping, the fire crackling. It requires a very artificial and complicated frame of mind to hear a pure noise. The fact that motorcycles and wagons are what we proximally hear is the phenomenal evidence that in every case Dasein, as being in the world, already dwells alongside what is ready to hand within the world. It certainly does not dwell proximally alongside sensations, nor would it have first to give shape to the swirl of sensations to provide the springboard from which the subject leaps off and finally arrives at a world. Dasein as essentially understanding is proximally alongside what is understood, unquote. It is on the basis of this discourse that we get anything like language. And it should follow the above analysis that in language we never first hear the words or grammar, but we hear what is being said. Of course, we can analyze language and understand things like its grammatical structure or how it sounds from a purely acoustic point of view, but this is always something we do by abstracting out of our use of language in order to point out the shared intelligibility of the world that we dwell in along other Daseins. As Dreyfus points out, we get to understand how uncanny language is when it is de-worlded if we repeat a certain word until it loses all meaning and merely becomes a strange bunch of sounds. First and foremost, we learn language by using it and not by conceptualizing it theoretically. Even when we encounter a language that we do not speak, we take it as an unintelligible language and not as a pure mishmash of sound tones. Whenever we use language, we do more than merely understand words and grammar. Language is primarily used as a tool to encounter the shared significance that the world has to us with other Daseins. This is a very difficult idea to get used to. We normally think of language as a way of transferring something that we have on the inside and moving it to the outside world so others can internalize it into theirs. As Dreyfus humorously points out, we are brainwashed into believing language operates this way as soon as we are of age to sit down and watch Sesame Street as kids. But for Heidegger, this idea is totally wrong and is a remnant of the Cartesian view that isolates the self as an internal I thing that is set apart from the world. Language is something we use as a tool in a world that is already shared. To remember exactly where we are in the text, we explored disposedness, understanding, and discourse thoroughly because these three characteristics are equiprimordial for Dasein's being in. Dasein is the discourse of a certain there, and these three determine the makeup of that there. However, we ended the last chapter by pointing out that Dasein is, by and large, lost in and already given over to the they in its public life. Now it is time to tie these two things together. Heidegger points out that the general movement of Dasein in its everydayness takes place via thrownness, as exemplified by disposedness, projection, as exemplified by understanding, and falling. Dasein is, in its average everyday existence, in a state of fallenness. Again, it is important that despite... The evocative, somewhat religious-sounding language, this by no means has any sense of negative judgment. It is a description of an existential structure, not a lesson on how we should or should not be. There is no falling here in the sense of fallen into sin or fallen from a state of grace. It is simply a description of how we exist. By and large, Dasein is already fallen into the world, and turned away from its own self, its own authenticity, and thus an awareness of what it really means to be. What exactly makes up this fallenness, and how does it cover up our real nature and being? Heidegger calls attention to three characteristics of it. Idle talk, curiosity, 
and ambiguity. Heidegger's own descriptions of these three characteristics is pretty self-explanatory, so I'll quote him at length, but explain them a little bit. The first one, Gereda, or idle talk, signifies the variety of unexamined talking and average communication that the they-self has to engage in. Note the etymological connection of Gereda, or idle talk, to Reda, or discourse. This is because what is authentic and original in discourse gets passed along and perverted through the realm of idle talk. In idle talk, lots of things get said without much importance and a general sense of intelligibility comes to us, but we never discover its ground. We hear about what happened, what it means, and how we should feel about it, but always submit to the they to give it its significance. This keeps Dasein constantly uprooted and cut off from a more direct relationship to the world. Quote, The being said, the dictum, the pronouncement, all these now stand surety for the genuineness of the discourse and of the understanding which belongs to it, and for its appropriateness to the facts. And because this discoursing has lost its primary relationship of being towards the entity talked about, or else has never achieved such a relationship, it does not communicate in such a way as to let this entity be appropriated in a primordial manner, but communicates rather by, the follow by following the route of gossiping and passing the word along. What is said in the talk as such spreads in wider circles and takes on an authoritative character. Things are so because one says so. Idle talk is constituted by just gossiping and passing the word along a process by which its initial lack of grounds to stand on becomes aggravated to complete groundlessness. And indeed, this idle talk is not confined to vocal gossip, but even spreads to what we write, where it takes the form of scribbling. In this case, the gossip is not based so much on hearsay. It feeds upon superficial reading. The average understanding of the reader will never be able to decide what has been drawn from primordial sources with a struggle, and how much is just gossip. The average understanding, moreover, will not want any such distinction, and does not need it, because of course it understands everything. Neugier, or curiosity, signifies Dasein constantly looking outward for new and novel things. It is constantly hustling and bustling to read the newest headlines, see the newest movie, and so on. But never to really stay anywhere long. Curiosity keeps Dasein constantly engaged, but really always distracted. It takes on an inordinate number of facts, but doesn't really come into touch with the most central questions. In making everything a possible avenue for exploration, it equalizes everything, and in doing so keeps everything at the same equal distance, never allowing things to really gain significance. It never allows Dasein to dwell. Curiosity is stimulus, but never really meaning, and therefore none of it allows Dasein to take itself back from the they. Quote, when curiosity has become free, however, it concerns itself with seeing, not in order to understand what is seen, that is, to come into a being towards it, but just in order to see. It seeks novelty only in order to leap from it anew to another novelty. In this kind of seeing, that which is an issue for care does not lie in grasping something and being knowingly in the truth, it lies rather in its possibilities of abandoning itself to the world. Therefore, curiosity is characterized by a specific way of not tarrying along, side what is closest. Consequently, it does not seek the leisure of tarrying observantly, but rather seeks restlessness in the excitement of continual novelty and changing encounters. In not tarrying, curiosity is concerned with the constant possibility of distraction. Curiosity has nothing to do with observing entities and marveling at them. Thalmazain. To be amazed to the point of not understanding is something in which it has no interest. Rather, it concerns itself with a kind of knowing, but just in order to have known. Both this not tarrying in the environment with which one concerns oneself and this distraction by new possibilities are constitutive items for curiosity, and upon these is founded the third essential characteristic of the phenomenon, which we call the character of never dwelling anywhere. Curiosity is everywhere and nowhere. This mode of being in the world reveals a new being, kind of being of everyday Dasein, a kind in which Dasein is constantly uprooting itself." Unquote. 
Lastly, Zweideutigkeit, or ambiguity, signifies how in our everyday they self we become unable to distinguish what is genuinely disclosed and what is not. It makes everything seem as though it were already fully grasped and understood. We accept the public understanding of the they as if it were our own and become unable to tell one from the other. The ability and necessity of coming to terms with ourself in an authentic way begins to seem superfluous and alien. Quote, Everything looks as if it were genuinely understood, genuinely taken hold of, genuinely spoken, though at bottom it is not, or else it does not look so, and yet at bottom it is. Ambiguity not only affects the way we avail ourselves of what is accessible for use and enjoyment, and the way we manage it. Ambiguity has already established itself in the understanding as a potentiality for being, and in the way Dasein projects itself and presents itself with possibilities. Everyone is acquainted with what is up for discussion and what occurs, and everyone discusses it, but everyone also knows already how to talk about what has to happen first, about what is not yet up for discussion but really must be done. Already everyone has surmised and sent it out in advance what others have also surmised and sent it out. This being on the scent is of course based on hearsay, for if anyone is genuinely on the scent of anything, he does not speak about it. And this is the most entangling way in which ambiguity presents Dasein's possibilities, so that they will already be stifled in their power." Unquote. Such is our average everydayness, or inauthentic self. Under the conditions of idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity, we remain largely pacified and tranquil. Tranquil, of course, doesn't mean lazy. As Heidegger says, quote, This tranquility in inauthentic being does not seduce one into stagnation and inactivity, but drives one into uninhibited hustle. Being fallen into the world does not somehow come to rest. The tempting tranquilization aggravates the falling. With special regard to the interpretation of Dasein, the opinion may now arise that understanding the most alien cultures and synthesizing them with one's own may lead Dasein to may lead to Dasein's becoming for the first time thoroughly and genuinely enlightened about itself. Versatile curiosity and restlessly knowing it all masquerade as a universal understanding of Dasein. But at bottom it remains indefinite what is really to be understood, and the question has not even been asked. Nor has it been understood that understanding itself is a potentiality for being which must be made free in one's own most Dasein alone. When Dasein, tranquilized and understanding everything, thus compares itself with everything, it drifts along towards an alienation in which its own most potentiality for being is hidden from it. Falling being in the world is not only tempting and tranquilizing, it is at the same time alienating. Nor is this deprived of an apparent, although really sham, understanding of the self, as Heidegger explains in this section which has a nice barb at contemporaries like Carl Jung. Quote, Yet this alienation cannot mean that Dasein gets factically torn away from itself. On the contrary, this alienation drives it into a kind of being which borders on the most exaggerated self-dissection, tempting itself with all possibilities of explanation, so that the very characterologies and typologies which it has brought about are themselves already becoming something that cannot be surveyed at a glance. This alienation closes off from Dasein its authenticity and possibility, even if only the possibility of genuinely foundering. It does not, however, surrender Dasein to an entity which Dasein itself is not, but forces it into its inauthenticity, into a possible kind of being of itself. The alienation of falling, at once tempting and tranquilizing, leads by its own movement to Dasein's getting entangled in itself. In our fallenness, we have a life that is full of stimulus and apparent understanding and never have to question. Quote, The phenomena we have pointed out, temptation, tranquilizing, alienation, and self-entangling, characterize the specific kind of being which belongs to falling. This movement of Dasein in its own being we call its downward plunge. Dasein plunges out of itself into itself, 
into the groundlessness and nullity of inauthentic everydayness, but this plunge remains hidden from Dasein by the way things have been publicly interpreted, so much so indeed that it gets interpreted as a way of ascending and living concretely." Unquote. This fallenness is something that we all need on some level. That is why we should never think of inauthenticity as an, inher as an inherently bad thing, and certainly not as something less real than authenticity. Nor should the two be thought of as totally separate. Authenticity and inauthenticity don't have to do with being in the presence of such everydayness or not. We are always being in the world. They have to do with how this everydayness is seized upon and responded to. All of this has prepared the ground for the final chapter of the First Division, where Heidegger will sketch out Dasein in its everydayness as a structural whole. Chapter 6. Care as the Being of Dasein You might ask why it is so important to unite all of the above existentials as some kind of structural whole. Remember that this analysis is ultimately preparatory. It is ultimately meant to spell out the ontological ground of everydayness. If there was no way to do that, we couldn't move from the being of everyday Dasein to being more generally. All we would have is a bunch of random phenomenological observations. As the title of this book indicates, that ground is ultimately time. But to get to why that is, we have to understand what it is to be Dasein at its core, beyond just listing a bunch of features of Dasein's being. That ultimate ground of what it is to be Dasein turns out to be what Heidegger calls Zorge, or care. This should not be read in the sense of mushy sentimentality that the word has in English, but in the most general sense of caring about one thing or another. In order to reveal that Dasein's being is care, Heidegger calls attention to a rather revealing phenomenal experience, the experience of angst. This term, angst, is generally translated as anxiety in the English, and it's not an inaccurate translation, but we might misunderstand it if we take this word too clinically in the sense of social anxiety disorder. Heidegger wants to make it clearer by contrasting it with fear. When we are afraid, it is always of some definite, threatening entity. But in anxiety, it is our being itself which makes us anxious. I will largely follow Hubert L. Dreyfus's explanation here. If we remember, at the very beginning of this analytic, we discussed what happens when some piece of equipment breaks down and becomes unusable. For example, if a keyboard stops responding when I'm typing an email. It begins to light up the whole web of relations and involvements that structure the world we dwell in. Anxiety is more or less the same thing happening, but with Dasein instead of with a piece of equipment. Dasein generally comes to understand itself in terms of the they, and what is laid out for it in the public world that it is thrown into. But everyone has had an experience where somehow we no longer feel at home in the world, or see a place for ourselves to exist inside of it. Everything feels uncanny, quite literally in fact, as the original German word for uncanny, unheimlich, literally means not at home. In anxiety, Dasein retreats out of the world and sees it as an alien place that it sees no way to exist in the midst of in the way it normally can. The more the world becomes clear and salient as a world, the less of a place for ourselves we see in it. Hubert L. Dreyfus explains this so well that I will quote him here, with a few Heideggerian phrases modified to my preferred translations. Quote, When anxious Dasein is drawn away from the roles and equipment it has taken up, the for the sake of which is provided by the they, and the whole referential nexus appear as constructs, a cultural conspiracy to provide the illusion of some ultimate meaning-motivating action. Social action now appears as a game which there is no point in playing since it has no intrinsic meaning. Serious involvement is revealed as illusio, Bordeaux would say. The anxious Dasein can still see that there is a whole system of roles and equipment that can be used by anyone, but just for that very reason, the system has no essential relation to it. 
equipment is still present with its in-order twos, but Dasein no longer experiences itself as assigned to a for the sake of which, and so lacks a reason for using it. Unquote. Dreyfus recommends the films of Michelangelo Antonioni as a particularly evocative depiction of anxiety, which can help us to get a handle on what Heidegger is talking about. Quote, the Red Desert portrays the heroine as walking around in a perpetual fog, while in Le Clisse, which seems close to Heidegger's account, objects are seen in stark clarity with a kind of cold mysteriousness. They have lost their significance for the heroine who drifts past them unable to act while other people go on busily using them, unquote. In anxiety, everything seems uncanny and strange, and yet there is never a particular object or phenomenon that this uncanniness is oriented towards. That is precisely because unlike a mood like fear, which is directed at a particular frightening thing in the world, what evokes anxiety is our own being. Again, I will quote Heidegger at length because no one describes it better than him. Quote, Accordingly, when something threatening brings itself close, anxiety does not see any definite here or yonder from which it comes. That in the face of which one has anxiety is characterized by the fact that what threatens is nowhere. Anxiety does not know what that in the face of which it is anxious is. Nowhere, however, does not signify nothing. This is where any region lies, and there, too, lies any disclosedness of the world for essentially spatial being in. Therefore, that which threatens cannot bring itself close from a definite direction within what is close by. It is already there and yet nowhere. It is so close that it is oppressive and stifles one's breath, and yet it is nowhere. In that in the face of which one has anxiety, the it is nothing and nowhere becomes manifest. The obstinacy of the nothing and nowhere within the world means as a phenomenon that the world as such is that in the face of which one has anxiety. The utter insignificance which makes itself known in the nothing and nowhere does not signify that the world is absent, but tells us that entities within the world are of so little importance in themselves that on the basis of this insignificance of what is within the world, the world in its worldhood is all that still obtrudes itself. What oppresses us is not this or that, nor is it the summation of everything present at hand. It is rather the possibility of the ready-to-hand in general. That is to say, it is the world itself. When anxiety has subsided, then in our everyday way of talking we are accustomed to say that it was really nothing. And what it was indeed does get reached ontically by such a way of talking. Everyday discourse tends towards concerning itself with the ready-to-hand and talking about it. That in the face of which anxiety is anxious is nothing ready to hand within the world. But this nothing ready to hand, which only our everyday circumspective discourse understands, is not totally nothing. The nothing of readiness to hand is grounded in the most primordial something in the world. Ontologically, however, the world belongs essentially to Dasein's being as being in the world. So if the nothing, that is the world as such, exhibits itself as that in the face of which one has anxiety, this means that being in the world itself is that in the face of which anxiety is anxious." Unquote. All of the above goes to say that while anxiety is never about anything in particular, it does reveal something deeply real. Namely, it reveals to Dasein its own true nature. In anxiety, Dasein realizes most who it truly is. We suddenly realize how we are thrown into the world and the possibilities that are before us. Before us, not the they. We have a complete view of our own freedom and individuality. And that is, in a sense, frightening. It is Dasein in its most authentic state, where we have a complete view of our individual existence. It should now be no wonder that so often we seek to give up ourselves to the they and live a distracted everyday existence. This direct confrontation with our own being in the world brings us face to face with a paralyzing awareness of our own inherent groundlessness, and that can be unsettling. The good news, however, is that anxiety is not the only way to experience our individual existence. It is simply the one that is easiest to understand. And what is that individual existence? 
It is what stands before us clearly in anxiety. Heidegger calls this structure of our existence Zorge, or care. And again, just to remind ourselves, this has nothing to do with some loving sense of compassion. Heidegger himself gives a very unwieldy but useful and important definition of care. It is... The being of Dasein means ahead of itself being already in the world as being alongside entities encountered within the world. In more simple terms, care means some sort of caring towards something or another. It means being interested, concerned, excited, disappointed, etc. Even the most neutral and disinterested disposition we could have is not truly devoid of care. The scientist, for example, still cares to obtain objective data and thus comports himself in a way that will allow him to obtain it. Nothing comes before care in the being of Dasein. Of course, that does not mean that care is some primal element. It is still a phenomenon that is articulated. We are focusing less on a substance or a process and more on a structure. To return to Heidegger's formulation, as Dasein we project possibilities. Dasein doesn't just have possibilities, it is possibilities. It is aware of possible ways to be, whether they are authentic, oriented around my own being, or inauthentic, oriented around the being of the they. His term for this being, in which being itself is an issue for Dasein, is being ahead of itself. That is because we understand our current possibilities not solely by what is currently actual, but also by what is not yet and outside of ourselves. But Heidegger says Dasein is ahead of itself being already in the world. This is because we come to project possibilities in a world we are already thrown into, and thus have a certain defined range, context, and disposedness that characterizes the possibilities we project. Dasein is also already being alongside. It is fallen into the world, which is to say it is for the most part occupied with particular things and duties in its average everydayness. This is the structure of care, and it is reflected as we see in disposedness, understanding, and fallenness, and with it thrownness, projection, and absorption in the publicness of the they. In Division 2, we will more explicitly talk about the care structure as it manifests in Dasein's authentic state, which we have only hinted at up to now, and ultimately we will show that the ground for Dasein's being as care is time. But before that, Heidegger takes the time to address a few of the more traditional problems of philosophy that might come to mind on the basis of what we have established thus far, and to do so on sturdier ground. Many of these are traditional problems of epistemology, since Heidegger essentially does his best to absorb the entire field of epistemology into that of ontology. Let's start by thinking about reality. What is real? Is the world just my experience of it? Does the external world exist outside of me? Are other people real or just part of my imagination? Heidegger has already started to undermine the traditional idea of the world as a number of objects set apart from a subject that we are, but now he really takes the whole traditional Cartesian view apart. It is important to do, as most objections to and criticisms of Heidegger will probably rely on some form of this metaphysical picture. If we can argue against and dissolve the whole problem of reality in the first place, these criticisms won't need to emerge. Traditionally, when defining reality, philosophers have conceived of it as simply the full aggregate of objects that there are out there. There are a number of objects that are sterile and empty of meaning and significance beyond the most neutral things we can say about them, like their material extension in space. In their reality, they are mere physical material things with no actual meaning, such as their view. The problem with this view is that there's nothing that makes this barren scientific view more immediately correct. We never arrive at the meaning or essence of a thing by encountering it in its barren, so-called reality independent of the world. What we encounter in the essence here is not the thing itself. We are encountering What we are encountering is the function it plays in our world, which is always how we interpret what a thing is. Seeing a hammer as extended wood and metal fashioned in X formation, is at the end of the day also an interpretation, 
It is simply one that is in a very different disposedness and with a very different purpose in mind than seeing it as a thing used to make things stay in place. Reality, as philosophers have traditionally thought of it, is basically accurately translated as presence at hand in Heidegger's terminology. And we should see presence as ha at hand as one mode of how we relate to the world. If we think of it this way, and not as a separate realm that we have some wall to overcome in order to have access to the actuality of, much of the problems disappear. There have been many great thinkers who have used some sort of argument to make various statements about how our interior relates to the exterior world and the reality thereof. But this whole problem of uniting the exterior versus interior is all based on something that is mistaken. The idea that there is an isolated subject or ego that has to reach out over some gap to reach the real world. There is no such thing as an isolated, worldless subject or ego. Dasein already has a world by its own structure. Dasein is being in the world, and the world comes into existence already along with it. There is no need to prove the reality of an external world, nor to presuppose it, nor to just take it as a matter of faith. All of this is based on a division that is assumed but not substantiated by our phenomenological experience. There is no need to take up the problem of Dasein somehow getting to the world. It is always already in it. Rather than a bunch of present-at-hand objects, Heidegger says that reality is something that emerges in the care structure along with Dasein and the world. This is sort of a troubling idea. In a lot of ways, most of the extreme postmodern thinkers who try to reduce all scientific truths to social constructs that are so annoying and troublesome have an intellectual lineage that can somehow or other be traced back to Heidegger. However, a careful reading of what Heidegger actually argues reveals something very different. His view is subtle and equally sensitive to cultural relativism and to the integrity and importance of scientific consensus. In fact, some, like Michael Wheeler, have even argued that we can basically call Heidegger's view in being in time a form of scientific realism. Let's get really clear about it, though. The view that we seem required to take in science is that there is an independent reality that does not depend on us, and that in doing scientific experiments and arriving at conclusions, we gain access to this reality, or at least are able to decide what is most likely to be true of it. This seems at first glance to sit ill at ease with Heidegger's onological project. This is because Heidegger says that the reason we have access to things in the world is that reality emerges in a shared social context of meaning. Remember, we come to conceive of what things are based on our designs, interests, possibilities, and so on. We come to understand what something like a hammer is based not on some world-independent features that we analyze, but on how it serves us and gets used in a wide nexus of assigned meaning. Even if we do take a more cool-headed, so-called scientific approach, and look at a hammer as a hunk of wood and metal with various properties of size, weight, texture, and so on, this is still something we in the end interpret for a certain purpose, namely the purpose of scientific knowledge. When we think about reality in the scientific sense, we are thinking of this present-at-hand encounter for the purpose of making discoveries. Now, the scientists might say that this present-at-hand view is the one that is most real. For example, we normally encounter water as ready-to-hand, as equipment to wash dishes with, to swim in, to watch, pour to watch pouring out of a fountain, and so on. But by stripping away these involvements, we arrive at water not as a tool or equipment, but as H2O. This is independent of our interests and uses, of course. Water was H2O before we ever discovered what H2O was, indeed before human beings ever emerged on the planet. However, we have to remember that there is never being without a taking as. Things can be independent of Dasein, but there is never intelligibility that is independent of Dasein. Things like trees, mountains, rivers, and so on can occur without Dasein, as they have for thousands and thousands of years before human beings ever emerged on the planet. But in order for them to come into being, Dasein is necessary. 
Dasein is necessary to take any entity as either ready to hand or even as present at hand. It's important to dwell on that last part especially. Even understanding any independent any entity as independent of us is something that requires Dasein to become intelligible. After all, there is no concept of independent of Dasein without understanding Dasein. While things can occur without being dependent on Dasein, there is never any intelligibility and thus never any being to them without us. This is a hard point to get at because anything we say about something scientific is something we get at through intelligibility. Technically, even dividing up nature into things like trees, rocks, and so on is a form of making them intelligible to us. So there's pretty much nothing we can say about the real that has nothing to do with us. But the point remains that all forms of making things intelligible, either as something we are involved with, ready to hand, or as something independent of our concerns, present at hand, is a kind of interpretation, and that cannot occur without Dasein. In the end, it seems as though Heidegger's position is that the real, in terms of what occurs and not, is indeed independent of us. Nature is whatever it is independently of what we think about it. However, nature only gains intelligibility and offers anything up as something we can have access to the being of on the basis of certain background practices that determine how the real will show up. For example, and I'm totally making this up, let's imagine that there was some ancient culture which explained that oil and water never mixed because the god of the sea and the god of the vineyard dislike each other because they're competitive sources of food. That might seem quaint nowadays, where we explain it because of the molecular properties of these two substances. But both of these are ultimately structures of intelligibility and meaning that we set up to decide what can count as fact. And importantly, whichever one we have, they can never actually change what those facts are. Whether we set up a social practice explaining things in terms of angry gods, or in terms of incompatible molecules, oil and water still refuse to mix, and that fact that they do seems to be what is independent of us. There is a potentially unsettling upshot of this, however. It, in the end, equalizes science a bit with other ways in which the real is disclosed to us. That is to say, Heidegger does not think that science is the ultimate way in which everything else becomes intelligible. The only thing that ever grounds one set of social practices as the one that makes everything else intelligible is Dasein. Modern science is one way of revealing and describing the real, and it is a social practice at the end of the day. So is religion, so is ethics, so is art, so is history. All of these are ways that things can give us access to some kind of truth and be ways of understanding, and Heidegger doesn't seem to rank one above the other. This might be a bit unsettling to the scientists out there, but really nothing about this view puts anything established in science's danger. In danger. Heidegger doesn't think that science is merely a matter of convention or open to not being true or anything. He gives it all the integrity it has and deserves. But no one should expect a poetic or ethical sense of revealing, for example, to answer the kinds of questions asked in science, or vice versa. Heidegger would probably be very sympathetic to Stephen Jay Gould's conception of science and religion as non-overlapping magisteria. Dreyfus calls Heidegger a plural realist for this reason, in that he seems to think that there are multiple ways that we arrive at truth about what is real. But, as Pontius Pilate once said, what is truth? What is the truth that we get access to in science and presumably in philosophy as well? What does it mean to say that something is true? For Heidegger, the philosophical tradition has erred when trying to answer this question. The tradition only tells us when something is true or false. They give us the criterion for truth but they don't answer the question of what truth actually means. We traditionally think of truth as correspondence. This is the business of propositional logic and should strike most of us as intuitive. For example, if I have a proposition like, I have a pen on my desk, 
we'd have to look at the actual state of affairs in the real world and see if it matches up. If it does indeed correspond to what we encounter in the real world, then it is true. This is truth as correspondence. But all of these theories and others like them just really answer when an instance of truth occurs. What is actually happening in one of these instances of truth? For Heidegger, truth is first always a disclosure. In his post-Being in Time works, Heidegger will especially latch on to an ancient Greek word for truth, aletheia. Lethe in Greek means literally concealment, hiddenness, coveredness, and so on. It is most famous for appearing as the name of the river Lethe in the underworld in Greek mythology, where the shades of the dead go, drink, and forget their former lives. Alethea is thus an unconcealing, an unhiding, an uncovering, a disclosure. For Heidegger, this is the most foundational meaning that there is to truth. Truth as correspondence is a derived phenomenon and not a full understanding of the truth. How is this so? Well, consider a proposition like, I have a pen on my desk. How do we verify if this is true or false? By seeing if it corresponds to the real fact of the matter. But I need to look at the desk and actually see if there is or is not a pen in order to do that. In other words, I look at the desk and a pen is either disclosed to me or not. So correspondence is something that can only emerge on the basis of something showing itself to me so I can compare what is real with the proposition. I have to already have some awareness of a phenomenon called a pen to know if what I am looking at counts or not. But this disclosure process where happens as a part of our own being in the world. And this is the point that Heidegger wants to make. Truth is not a characteristic of propositions and not of the things in the world that they refer to. Truth is a characteristic of Dasein. Remember that Dasein is always the disclosure of some there or another. The whole structure of care involves us being alongside entities within the world. And in order for us to grasp and encounter any entities whatsoever, they have to somehow become disclosed to us. The number of entities disclosed is always some definite range, because Dasein is thrown into the world. It is always in some state or other, and thus focused on some entities or other. When Dasein comes to understand, it projects itself onto its possibilities. This is the most primal and immediate kind of truth that there is. When Dasein becomes authentic, it gains a genuine understanding of its own possibilities. And we have to remember that we come to interpret all things on the basis of possibilities. Because for Heidegger, possibility is prior to actuality. So this is the foundation of anything showing up for us. This isn't to say we can never get things wrong. This original disclosure eventually trickles down into assertions that we can use properly or improperly. For example, I can see a piece of cloth on the floor, think it's a cockroach, say that there is a cockroach on the floor, and be incorrect. But it is only possible to make this assertion and for it to be either correct or incorrect on the basis of some kind of disclosure that allowed me to understand what a cockroach is, what the floor is, and so on. We also have to remember that Dasein, in its average everydayness, exists in fallenness, where it becomes absorbed in the they. It is no wonder, then, that the original disclosure of something or other, which is not so easily explained in a simple proposition, more often than not ends up getting simplified and distorted through becoming hearsay and getting unthinkingly repeated. There is an important takeaway here, though. Dasein, in its inauthentic they-self, always covers up and is cut off from the original disclosure of truth. But fallenness is part and parcel of Dasein's being in the world. This means that both truth and untruth are equiprimordial for Dasein. Wherever there is some disclosure, it is because some other thing has been concealed or covered up. And that which is concealed or covered up is only so because some other things have been revealed. This is a very difficult concept to explain, 
An analogy that appears in this text at a few times is that of Dasein as a clearing, in the sense of a clearing in a forest. What comes to be comprehensible and disclosed is a small clearing in the midst of a vast forest of the unknown. For Heidegger, all revealing has to occur on a background of concealment. This does make some sense if we think about it. Remember that Dasein is the disclosedness of a certain there. But for any there to come to the fore, something else has to be ignored. Dasein can have its own existence and be recognized and understood as an individual thing precisely because it is a there and not an everywhere. As an example, think of how we might conceive of a tree. We might think of a tree as a fundamentally different thing than the seed it grows out of. But if we really stop and think about it for a minute, are they really different things? What is the moment that a seed stops being a seed and becomes a tree? Suddenly it's not so clear. We see the whole interrelated process of seed to sapling to tree, to decaying tree, to mulch, to new trees, and so on, and don't know where to draw the lines. But ultimately, we are able to make sense of a seed as a different thing than a tree, even though there are no firm boundaries. It's precisely because we choose to ignore a substantial amount of ways that the seed is related to other phenomena that it can show up as a seed. If we don't put any of these barriers up, then the seed won't be revealed as its own phenomenon because we can't tease it out from the tree, the soil, the nutrients from the sun, and so on. But if we cover up its relation in this full process of growing, sprouting, decaying, becoming mulch, and so on, we can isolate the seed as a thing in itself. There are always a huge manifold of potential ways for things to show up and be intelligible to us, and we always have to choose some and leave others behind. This discussion of truth is extremely important for the entire text, because ultimately what it does is give justification for the existential analytic of Dasein as something relevant and useful for answering the question of being generally. The idea that truth is not a feature of anything but Dasein is a bit troubling. It sounds like it might lapse into some very contentious ideas that border on extreme skepticism or even solipsism. But Heidegger is clear that Dasein never chooses what is true or false. It only responds to the truth as it is disclosed. There are no such things as eternal truths unless it is absolutely known that Dasein will exist forever. Things are true when they are disclosed in a world that we share with others and have some kind of shared background practices in, in which we can make statements about what is true or not. But we do not create these practices. We are thrown into them. And the fact that some things will be true or will not is not something we have control over. For example, water will always be H2O even when there are no humans. But it will not be true that water is H2O if there are no humans. That is because truth is something that is disclosed to Dasein. Without Dasein, there is no need for anything called truth. And as Michael Gelvin reminds us, what makes this so important is that because truth is disclosure, the entire analytic of Dasein can be taken up as something that is true, even as just a possibility. It is what makes this entire analytic philosophically valuable, and not just a kind of therapeutic reflection. In making the existential structure come to the fore, it has been disclosed to us, and that itself is what truth is, something being disclosed. And the fact that we can arrive at truth and thus achieve real philosophical discoveries by doing an existential analytic and ha thus having something disclosed to us means that it can open up the pathway to the question that the whole book is really after, the question of being in general. As I mentioned in the introduction, the full leap to being in general remains incomplete in being in time proper. But the next and last remaining division shifts to the real ontological work. Remember that the title of this first division is a preparatory analytic of Dasein. All of this was to lay the groundwork for really examining Dasein in its authentic state. In division two, he aims to show that the structure of care, and thus of all of Dasein's possibilities and the things they disclose, is actually temporality.
Division 2 Dasein and Temporality Chapter 1 Dasein's Possibility of Being a Whole and Being Towards Death it will be helpful to do a very quick review of where we are at this point in the text. In order to arrive at the meaning of being in general, we took the being of a specific entity, Dasein, as our theme. It is necessary to understand Dasein as a whole in order to have a genuine grasp of it. So that means that we began by looking at Dasein and its average everydayness. In this state, Dasein is being in the world and is no means set against, and is by no means set against the world or things in it as a subject set apart from objects. The world is the general nexus of meaning in which we experience the ready to hand. In being in the world, we are also being with, because we always have some awareness of and solicitude towards others. In fact, we are generally given over to the they in our everyday. The structure of this being in is complex. Dasein is the disclosure of a there. When it is disclosed, it comes into being with some disposedness and understanding. It exists in a thrownness because it is always already involved in some definite range of possibilities and affairs. Dasein comes to understand itself and anything else by projecting its possibilities. This projection of possibilities is how things gain meaning and it articulates this by means of discourse, upon the basis of which things become intelligible. But by and large, Dasein is fallen into the world and given over to the they. So this disclosure of its own possibilities, and thereby everything else as well, remains covered up. This entire complex structure is summed up in the word care, and defined as ahead of itself being already in the world as being alongside entities encountered within the world. The majority of Division 1 focused on Dasein in its average everydayness. It focused on Dasein in its inauthentic existence, fallen into the world and given over to the they-self. There were intimations of what authenticity means as a contrast, but we never really spent long on it. This is what Division 2 seeks to answer. And it will be ontologically relevant since, since, in, in, since in authenticity, we have a greater awareness of Dasein's real structure of being. We need to understand Dasein in its authenticity. That is, Dasein's mode of existence that has some degree of ontological awareness of what it means to be and some sense of its own individuality. In order to do that, it helps to get Dasein into view in its totality and with an awareness of the ontological meaning of its own being. However, there seems to be a roadblock before us when we try to understand Dasein in a holistic way. Near the end of the last section, we came to understand that Dasein is always ahead of itself. That is to say, it reaches out into its possibilities. In this way, Dasein is always more than it factually is. There is always something about Dasein that is still outstanding. Dasein always projects out into possibilities. It is its throne projection. With that in mind, it seems like we might not be able to ever get Dasein fully in view and have a complete grasp of what it is, because something will always still be outstanding. Indeed, it seems that definitionally, the moment Dasein has nothing more outstanding and not yet realized, it will no longer be Dasein. But there is something that presents Dasein with its undoubted end, and thus a sense of its own finitude, where it will be in a state where it no longer has any possibilities to reach out into. That something is its own death. Authentic Dasein has an awareness of death. Heidegger now has to analyze the ontological importance of death. And none of this has to do with the biological functions of ceasing vitality, the psychological understanding of death, any theological question of the possibility of life after death, anthropological questions about how we respond to and engage with death as a culture, or even just a moral assessment of whether dying is a good or bad thing and how we should conceive of it for our own betterment. This question is about what death means for Dasein. It provides it with finitude and thus helps it to get a holistic view of itself. Of course, there is a difficulty in this. 
Death is always, definitionally, out of our grasp. We don't experience our own death. Death is the end of all our experiences. If we can only have a total grasp of Dasein when we die, then wouldn't we by necessity never have a total grasp of Dasein? At first, it seems as though we might be able to understand it by experiencing the death of others. After all, most of us somehow come into contact with the phenomenon of death long before we actually die. People die every second of every day around the world, we hear of deaths constantly, and of course we all eventually experience friends and loved ones dying. But since Dasein is a being with in its average everydayness, we usually experience these deaths more in the sense of a relation of solicitude. We experience that person no longer being in the world, and the phenomenon of his lack and unavailability, or perhaps as rituals of memorial and remembrance, or even just as the pure, present-at-hand materiality of his lifeless corpse. But we don't actually experience his death as death. Quote, In such being with the dead, the deceased himself is no longer factically there. However, when we speak of being with, we always have in view being with one another in the same world. The deceased has abandoned our world and left it behind, but in terms of that world, those who remain can still be with him. The greater the phenomenal appropriateness with which we take the no longer Dasein of the deceased, the more plainly is it shown that in such being with the dead, the authentic being come to an end of the deceased is precisely the sort of thing which we do not experience. Death does indeed reveal itself as a loss, but a loss such as is experienced by those who remain. In suffering this loss, however, we have no way of access to the loss of being as such which the dying man suffers. The dying of others is not something which we experience in a genuine sense. At most, we are always just there alongside. Unquote. We never experience the death of another as death. That is because my death is always my own. We can substitute any other Dasein for ourselves or vice versa in understanding in a lot of public, everyday concerns and involvements. It is in fact quite necessary to do so to arrive at a shared world with others. But death is what gives us our wholeness. We can thus never understand what it actually means for any other Dasein to die. My death is always something that is only mine and can never be understood by another. I can live someone else's life, but I can never die someone else's death. My death is always what Heidegger calls my eigenste, or ownmost. So the problem still looms large. How can we get a sense of Dasein as a whole if there is always something outstanding, that is to say not yet realized, in its existence, and its finitude is only provided by death. The problem is solved when we conceive of this outstanding in the correct fashion. Simply put, Dasein does not actually need to be at its end to realize that it is going to end. We do not actually need to be at the end of our life to have a grasp of our totality, but only to be aware that we will die. It must be the case that to have a grasp of Dasein in its totality, we don't need a full catalog of all the actual experiences that any Dasein will have. That, indeed, would only be possible at death. But no particular experience, nor the sum of them all, is really relevant to what we are after. What we need to have is an awareness that it is possible for us not to be. Heidegger calls this Zein zum Tode, or being towards death. But Michael Gelvin reminds us that this is really just a fancy way of saying to be going to die. That doesn't mean the actual experience of death, nor a constant brooding over the fact that we will one day die. It is rather the existential awareness of the possibility of not being. Like anything else, we come to be aware of this through Dasein's own disclosure. We come into being towards death and thus authenticity in the same way we come into the in inauthenticity of our average everydayness via the care structure, which consists of 
being ahead of itself already in the world as being alongside entities which we encounter within the world. In articulating the care structure again, he focuses on understanding ahead of itself, thrownness being already in, and fallenness being alongside. First, understanding. Remember that our understanding is the projection of possibilities, and certainly death is a possibility for Dasein. Most notably, it is one that brings the very being of Dasein into focus in that it is unavoidable that we will do it alone and that no one can share it with us. In terms of thrownness, we are thrown into having to die. We find ourselves inevitably having to die. It is not something we chose. We get a revealing of it through disposedness, and the disposedness that reveals it is anxiety. If you remember the description of anxiety, or angst, in Division 1, it is a mood where we seem to be unable to find ourselves in the world. It individualizes us by making our own possibilities paralyzingly clear, but does so in a way that makes us seem unable to fit into the world. This sense of retreating and the lack of being of Dasein gives us a foretaste of death, and it individualizes us just as death does. Now, how does death relate to the last dimension, fallenness? Our fallenness is conditioned by an average absorption in the they, and we certainly have some relation to death in our everydayness. In fact, because death is so commonplace, it might sound strange at first that we are only authentic when we are aware of our possibility for dying. Aren't we all already aware of our possibility for dying, even in our average everydayness? None of us deny that we will someday die. It is simply a given. It seems like such an obvious truism as to not be any kind of revelation. But such is the covering up of that happens under the power of the they. We might have an awareness of death in our fallenness, but we never take it up as our own most possibility. In our publicness, we say things like, everyone dies, death is universal, nobody avoids death. We de-individualize it, and in doing so, run away from our own being towards death by making broad equivocations. We turn death into something which will of course reach Dasein someday, but doesn't belong to anyone in particular. What passes for an awareness and acknowledgement of death is really a method of covering it up, and not taking it up as something that is always ours, and ours alone. As we can see, the care structure remains evident even in being towards death, because it involves understanding, thrownness, and fallenness. After all, care is still the being of Dasein. And now we have the requisite link from Division 1, which discussed inauthentic Dasein, and this division which discusses authentic Dasein. The link is that both are grounded in care, and that the meaning of the being of both is still found in the care structure. We know that the inauthentic they-self hides death by turning it into something that is for everyone and thus common to all. Nothing could be further from the truth. Death is our own most. The primary way that this covering up of death occurs is by only seeing it as an actuality and not as a possibility. This sounds bizarre, as generally we would think of something actual as seemingly being more out in the open and real than something possible. But remember from the previous division that for Heidegger, possibility is ontologically prior to actuality, and the actual only exists because of the possible. And this makes sense in a way. As long as we only ever see death as an actuality, we will never take it as our own. That is because it will never be an actuality for us while we, were st while we are still alive. Indeed, definitionally, the moment death is an actuality for us, we are no longer there to take it as one. But if we look at death as a possibility, suddenly it is open to us. So what is being towards death if not just sitting around and looking towards death as an actual event that will someday come? In Heidegger's terminology, it is looking towards death as vorlaufen, anticipation, in contrast to erwarten, expectation. 
expectation is merely waiting for something that is probable to occur as an actuality someday. Anticipation, the original word in German, vorlaufen, etymologically means something like running ahead of, is to pick that thing up as a possibility that is our own. This is much more important than it seems, and an anticipatory attitude towards death in being towards death is the basis for authentic Dasein. When we come to understand the possibility of our not being, we also have the possibility of our own being revealed to us. In understanding that, we have the awareness of who we really are come to the fore. Of course, we seem to have some awareness of this in our everyday life. We say things like, before I die, I'd like to try skydiving, or before, or nobody has ever been on their deathbed wishing they'd spent more time at the office. We emphasize what is important to and central to us as our own selves by linking it to our death. This gives us what Heidegger calls freedom. It paradoxically comes with the awareness of something which is inevitable and unable to be resisted, our own eventual not being. But by coming to terms with that possibility, we get access to a way of being in which we have a full awareness of our possibilities as who we really are, not just as the they-self. It allows us to first understand that we are beings who exist and can exist in any way we wish, not just those prescribed by the they. Quote, Holding death for true, death is just one's own, shows another kind of certainty, and is more primordial than any certainty which relates to entities encountered within the world, or to formal objects, for it is certain of being in the world. As such, holding death for true does not demand just one definite kind of behavior in Dasein, but demands Dasein itself in the full authenticity of its existence. In anticipation, Dasein can first make certain of its own most being in its totality, a totality which is not to be outstripped. Therefore, the event evidential character, which comes to the immediate givenness of experiences of the I or of consciousness, must necessarily lag behind the certainty which anticipation includes. Yet, this is not because the way in which these are grasped would not be a rigorous one, but because in principle such a way of grasping them cannot hold for true, disclosed, something which at bottom it insists upon having there as true namely Dasein itself, which I myself am, and which as a potentiality for being, I can be authentically only by anticipation. Unquote. Quote, We may now summarize our characterization of authentic being towards death as we have projected it existentially. Anticipation reveals to Dasein its lostness in the they-self and brings it face to face with the possibility of being itself, primarily unsupported by concernful solicitude, but of being itself rather in an impassioned freedom towards death, a freedom which has been released from the illusions of the they, and which is factical, certain of itself, and anxious." Unquote. Chapter 2. Dasein's Attestation of an Authentic Potentiality for Being and Resoluteness Having this full awareness of our possibilities is what Heidegger calls an authentic potentiality for being, in that it is focused on our possibilities as ourselves, not as the they-self of our fallen everydayness. Heidegger says that this is largely understood through Gewissen, or conscience, which we experience as the call of care that awakens us to our guilt. This sounds quite spiritual, almost like a secularized form of Protestant Christianity, but it is really something that is rooted in our own normal average experience and certainly not some kind of mysticism. And strictly speaking, it has nothing to really do with ethics or doing the right thing, which is what makes all the talk about conscience and guilt that much more confusing. This chapter is extremely difficult, and we must proceed carefully to explain exactly what is going on in it. Heidegger's definition of guilt is very removed from the way we typically understand this word. But we should first focus on our everyday understanding of what it means to be guilty and see the phenomenological relevance of it, because it reflects the more basic existential structure of guilt to a good degree. We generally live in our normal 
undisturbed, involved circumspection. In our normal being in the world, we are inauthentic and don't focus on ourselves as an individual subject or I. However, suppose that suddenly one of our transgressions is made obvious. For example, maybe we forgot to turn off the light when leaving the room and left it on all day, wasting electricity. Or maybe we forgot our friend's birthday and realized the next day that we forgot to give her a message. Or maybe it's something much more extreme. Perhaps we cheated on an exam and the teacher calls us out by name before the class. In all of these situations, we feel that we are guilty. We sense that it is nothing that can be passed off onto someone else. We, as an individual, feel the guilt. At the same time, in this moment of guilt, we become acutely aware not only of thrownness, our current state of living with what we have done to incur this guilt, but also under our understanding as a projection onto possibilities. What are our possibilities now? What can we do now that we've been found guilty? Certainly, it is something only we can do. We cannot rely on the they to make up for whatever we have done. In this sense, being guilty uniquely makes us authentic. However, what I just sketched out is our typical average understanding of guilt. When Heidegger talks about Schuld, or guilt, he's talking about guilt as an existential structure, which is something more than just the state of affairs of some ethical breach, the actions taken to make up for that breach, or a fear about a punishment that will occur for that breach. The average, everyday understanding of guilt helps us get a sense of what the effect is like, but existential guilt is something far more broad. It has nothing to do with some bad action or feeling bad for it. It really has nothing to do with morality at all. In a very difficult section, Heidegger claims that to be guilty is for Dasein to be the basis or ground of a nullity or notness. What does this mean? To back up a bit, we should sketch out the full drama of how we come to terms with our guilt. He describes it as a call of conscience. In our average, everyday understanding of guilt, we can more or less understand this. When we have a sense of guilt, we feel the voice of conscience in the back of our head calling us out of our everyday existence and encouraging us to do better. But again, we're talking about something more fundamental than just feeling remorseful about doing some bad action. Michael Galvin explains that the call of conscience is a small drama of sorts that entirely happens between and about the self. The one who is called is our self in our fallen public mode. The one who does the calling is the self in our authentic mode. And it calls us to leave our fallenness and come into our own authenticity. Because it is only in authenticity that we can correctly respond to guilt. Now, what is this guilt that we experience? As I mentioned, it is not just remorse over an ethical breach of sorts. It is ourselves being the ground of a nullity. Let's try to explain this more clearly. When we experience the call of conscience, we experience the ability to choose to respond or not. This means that at the most fundamental, structural level of Dasein's existence, there is already a choice to make about how to act. It has the choice to be authentic or to not be authentic. It has the choice to be honest or dishonest. Any choice it makes also has its nullity, its opposite, its not, at the very basis along with it. What this reveals even more fundamentally is that Dasein is inherently groundless. While we are indeed thrown into our various circumstances and being in the world, there is not one way that we have to be at our core. None of the roles and dealings we have assigned to us in our fallen daily existence are who we really are. Our ground for our being is something that we have to seize on in one way or another. The call of conscience never makes one particular recommendation for the right or wrong way to act. It simply directs us to the guilt, and thus the ability to choose that we already have. It gives us back our agency. This is what guilt means at the basic fundamental level of, exist of the existentials. And that is something far more fundamental than just a sense of morals. In fact, Heidegger argues that the fact that we are necessarily guilty is the basis for there to be anything like morality in the first place. Before there can be morality, there must be an ability for us to choose one way or another.
The whole drama of the call of conscience nevertheless is still part of Dasein's being, and thus still reveals the structure of care. In experiencing the kind of anxiety where we can hear the call of conscience, Dasein feels no longer at home in the they, and has to come to terms with its own individualized existence. It becomes aware of the particular circumstances it has already inevitably found itself in. This is the dimension of thrownness as revealed via disposedness. In conscience, Dasein becomes aware of its guilt because it becomes aware that it is the ground of its own nullity. I, as my authentic self, can accept or reject the possibilities that I have, and this guilt is uniquely mine, my own most, because I cannot fall back on the they. This is the dimension of understanding via projection of possibilities. Thus, thrownness and understanding emerge in conscience. But there is a third part of the care structure which is fallenness, and that is not reflected in conscience. Why not? Because conscience is something that uniquely calls us to be authentic. It cannot exist in fallenness, which is necessarily inauthentic. Heidegger says that conscience is thus not distinguished by thrownness, understanding, and fallenness, but by what is equiprimordial for disclosure, thrownness, understanding, and discourse. This is because we experience our conscience as a call. We can only adequately respond to and recognize conscience if we keep silent and listen to when it calls for us. This form of being open, which is the ground for intelligibility, is discourse. And his name for this open and receptive listening, where we are not deafened by the loudness of the they, is reticence. Quote, in the call, one's constant being guilty is represented, and in this way the self is brought back from the loud idle talk which goes with the common sense of the they. Thus, the mode of articulative discourse which belongs to wanting to have a conscience is one of reticence. Keeping silent has been characterized as an essential possibility of discourse. Anyone who keeps silent when he wants to give us to understand something must have something to say. In the appeal, Dasein gives itself to understand its own most potentiality for being. This calling is therefore a keeping silent. The discourse of the conscience never comes to utterance. Only in keeping silent does the conscience call. That is to say, the call comes from the soundlessness of uncanniness, and the Dasein which it summons is called back into the stillness of itself, and called back as something that is to become still. Unquote. Heidegger's unwieldy description of the disclosure of Dasein that emerges in the call of conscience is thus, quote, reticent self-projection upon one's own most being guilty in which one is ready for anxiety, unquote. And this particular kind of authentic existence, which we come to have a glimpse of via the experience of the call of conscience, is what Heidegger calls Entschlossenheit, or resoluteness. The term in German also means something like decision, resolve, having made up one's mind, and so on. Its etymological connection to freedom and choice is important. Authentic existence is resolute. It uniquely asserts its own existence and is grounded in its own sense of responsibility and guilt. And thus, it is uniquely free to be itself. When we are authentic and want to have a conscience, that is, appeal act without appeal to anything outside of us to justify what we do, we act resolutely. We act in our own name for ourselves and take full responsibility for our actions. In resoluteness, we realize that we are fundamentally not at home in the world and have no inherent natural way to be. It will be a form of disclosure where I am reticent and do not follow the traditional language, etc. to make it intelligible for me. Rather, I have to find it intelligible in terms of what is particular for me. That said, it would be a mistake to see resoluteness as changing us into a free-floating, isolated subject. Even in our authentic mode, we are still ultimately being in the world, and by nature being with. Resoluteness is simply a new mode of being with others in the world. It is one that has taken charge of its own awareness of itself and with it the full burden of responsibility for choosing its own existence, but not one that is indifferent or cut off from the world around it. 
In being resolute, we are as much in the world and in our particular own throne circumstances as we ever have been. But now we are able to take them up as our own and with a full recognition of our own authentic being, not simply have them laid out and preordained for us. To recall exactly what the point of this section is, it is to have a clearer grasp of Dasein's authentic existence, which comes out ultimately to be anticipatory resoluteness. This is the joining together of anticipation, the cumulative phenomenon of chapter 1, and resoluteness, the cumulative phenomenon of chapter 2. But how are the two to be linked, and what is the value in doing so? All of this is the business of the next chapter. Chapter 3. Dasein's authentic potentiality for being a whole, and temporality as the ontological meaning of care. Our understanding of Dasein is slowly becoming more and more holistic and complete. In its most authentic state, Dasein is anticipatory resoluteness. With this understanding of authentic Dasein, we can finally show the ultimate ground that makes Dasein possible, and that is temporality. First, however, we should explain why anticipation and resoluteness have to be linked together. Joining them, of course, makes a convenient shorthand for the being of authentic Dasein, but there is a natural reason to see the two as a unitary phenomenon and not simply a gluing together of separate characteristics. This is a very fine and subtle section, and I will follow closely both Michael Gelvin in his commentary and Mark A. Rathall and Max Murphy in their summary of being and time. In short, anticipation and resoluteness seem to always imply each other. They cannot be understood without each other. In Heideggerian terms, they are equiprimordial. When we are anticipatory, we understand our being as it most truly is, finite, individual, and uncanny, that is, not at home at, or specially constrained by, any particular state of affairs or social structure we find ourselves in. And when we are resolute, we realize that our being is inherently unjustifiable, that is to say, we have an awareness of our guilt, which is to say our inherent groundlessness and ability to choose for ourselves our way to be. We are aware that we cannot pass off our responsibility to anything else and cannot find a justification or ground for our behavior in anything but ourselves. These two phenomena tend to come together. Part of realizing our own guilt and groundlessness is realizing that we will someday die, and thus that we are necessarily finite and contingent. And in anticipating, the awareness we have of ourselves always makes our own awareness more clear to us. In doing this, we become free by escaping the bounds of the they, and thereby must also become resolute, as there is nothing left but ourselves to take charge of our own guilt. The unitary phenomenon of anticipatory resoluteness thus leaves us without anything left to cover up our true nature. We cannot deny the nullity at the basis of our existence that awakens us to our groundlessness by passing it off by passing off our own guilt. Nor can we flee and hide in the face of our own finitude and individuality by refusing to have an authentic being towards death. In anticipatory resoluteness, Dasein is uniquely whole and is uniquely itself. Of course, this doesn't mean that it ever becomes a purely present-at-hand thing. It still always is a way of existing that is being in the world. The self is never a solitary Cartesian soul substance, even when it is authentic. It is not an entity. Dasein is an entity, but the self is not. The self is rather a different way and structure of being. It is the quality that distinguishes authentic existence from inauthentic existence. But this only sounds strange when we have an overly Cartesian expectation of what the self should look like. As Michael Gelvin says, the question should never be what is the self, but what does it mean to be oneself? Selfhood is the quality that there is in authentic anticipatory resoluteness and what is missing in inauthentic absorption in the they. At the very beginning of this work, Heidegger made it clear that we are always caught in a hermeneutic circle in this investigation. We never start from zero, but always come to interpret things on the basis of something understood, as vague and indistinct as it might be.
We have a very vague understanding of what it means to be, but it is distorted and uncertain. The point of the text up until now has been to make this awareness more clear and salient. This is an important time to remember the genuine, generally circular nature of this text. We already have some knowledge of our existence, but sketching out its structure makes it more and more clear. The hermeneutic method never seeks to ground our knowledge of our existence in some other thing outside of it. Philosophers have tried to do this for 2,000 years by appealing to something like God, monad, substance, process, etc., and never really answered the question. We don't need to appeal to something outside of our existence to understand it. We just have to make it more clear. This is particularly important to remember as we are about to take a big step and make the leap to interpreting the being of Dasein in terms of temporality. But before that, we have to take the final step in seeing Dasein as a structural whole. With that in mind, we can return to Dasein's existence structure. It has not changed. Whether authentic or inauthentic, that structure is care. And care is being ahead of itself already in the world as being alongside entities encountered within the world. It articulates, it articulates itself as thrownness slash disposedness, understanding slash projection, and fallenness slash discourse. Because Dasein is always ahead of itself, it seems impossible at first to get it into our view as a whole. But as part of the care structure, care can appeal to Dasein via a call of conscience. This summons Dasein towards an authentic understanding of itself via anticipatory resoluteness, where it appears as itself and as a whole. And now we can also say what its meaning is not simply existentially, but ontologically. That is to say, we shouldn't just interpret Dasein's being on the level of our interest in and relation to our own being, but to what that being means in and of itself. Dasein's authentic existence is anticipatory resoluteness, so the question for the ultimate ontological basis of Dasein now becomes, on the basis of what can there be anticipatory resoluteness? The answer is temporality. In order for there to be anticipatory resoluteness, we have to exist in time. This is the largest pivot in the text of being and time as it exists. We haven't yet made the leap from the being of Dasein to being in general, and indeed won't in the whole existing text of the book. That only would have happened in later portions that were never finished. But we, we, what we will do at this point is move from the mere existential structure of Dasein to time as the ontological ground that made this analysis possible. This is a hefty undertaking. It involves essentially having to repeat the entire analysis of Dasein on a more fundamental basis, but it is necessary to do this in order to firmly establish the ontological ground of Dasein's being, and in doing so hopefully to have a basis to make the jump to being proper. Now, we would do well to remind ourselves of what exactly we are doing. We are asking about the meaning of what it is for Dasein to be on a more fundamental level. But we need to remember exactly what meaning is as well. At the end of Division 1, we explain that meaning is a phenomenon that occurs on the basis of understanding and interpretation. Meaning is, most simply put, the result of us projecting our own possibilities. For example, in order for a lamp to be a lamp, it has to be something we can use to light up an area. How is it possible for such a thing to be a lamp? To, for me to be able to use it to light up an area. When we ask about what something means, we are asking what makes it possible to be. So now we have to ask the same question about Dasein's being, which is care. How is it possible for there to be care? We have already seen how care comes into being for us, but how is it possible for it to do so? Well, if we remember, the most authentic base of care that allows Dasein to show up as a complete structural whole is anticipatory resoluteness. So the question is now, on the basis of what is anticipatory resoluteness possible? And the answer is time. More accurately, it is temporality. What is the difference between these two? Time, more or less, means exactly what it does in our normal speech. It is the typical, present-at-hand understanding of clock time, of time as a series of successive nows that we have in our daily engagements, or alternatively, even the relativistic sense of time that's been established in modern physics. 
but this is an understanding of time that is present at hand. Temporality is rather a phenomenon in which Dasein orients itself and is one that it is able to ground its existence in. It consists of three ecstasies of past, present, and future, but these are not to be understood simply as a timeline of sequential nows. The term ecstasis in Greek literally means a standing out of sorts. This is where the term ecstasy in the sense of rapturous joy comes from, as in extreme rapturous joy we are beside ourselves or outside of ourselves with joy. We stand out from ourselves in joy. Thus, the ecstases of future, past, and present are kinds of forms or patterns that structure how things will show up for us. Literally, they make things stand out from the general temporal sense in a particular direction. This will become more clear as we discuss the temporal dimensions of anticipatory resoluteness and then in turn of Dasein more holistically. Much of the following analysis is based on the work of Michael Gelvin. Traditionally, we think of the present as being the real locus of what and who we are. But Heidegger makes a surprising claim. The extas of the present is by far the least important for what we as Dasein really are. It is still important, of course. Dasein is temporal, and all three extases are essential for the way it exists. But he says that the most important of the three is by far the extas of the future, then the past, and finally the present. Thus, rather than really being in the present, he says that the real locus of ourself is in the extase of the future. This should make a good deal of sense, however, when we remember that anticipatory resoluteness is a being towards. It is based on a being towards death. In it, Dasein authentically takes on and owns its own possibilities. But there is no being towards anything at all unless there is a future. Of course, this is something more basic than simply the future in a sense of a not yet occurring now. It is the future in the sense of what we look out and go towards. It is something that has meaning for us. All forms of awareness and consciousness consist in our attitude of being towards a future. The German word for future, Zukunft, literally means a coming toward, and Heidegger often puts a hyphen in the word, writing it as Zukunft to emphasize this meaning. This way of relation that is futurally oriented is the extas of the future. Since Dasein is a projection into its possibilities and is always being ahead of itself, it should make sense that he attaches such importance to it. Of course, we cannot move towards the future without also coming from a past. We have a great deal of meaning on the basis of our past. If you don't believe it at all, try to conceive of yourself without making any reference to your past in any way. It's almost impossible to do so, and if you could conceive of yourself completely isolated from your past, it probably wouldn't seem very much like you at all. But again, the past does not merely have meaning as a no longer occurring now. It is also something more complex than just the function of memory. When we note the importance of the phenomenon of memory, that already presupposes the importance and meaning that the past has to the present. It simply shows how the past gets related meaningfully to the present and future. The past, then, as an extas, has meaning as the thing that we come out from whenever we move towards something. Traditionally, the present is the most difficult and elusive of the three dimensions of time. It is that on the basis of which the past and future gain their meaning, it seems. But is there any real thing called the present? Is there some infinitesimal moment of nowhood that constantly gets replaced? Or is the present merely a kind of dividing line that nothing really exists in? Those kind of questions, however, are concerned with present at hand time and not with temporality. And furthermore, those questions only plague us if we view the present as the significant focal point of our existence. But Heidegger doesn't. He believes that the future is the most important of the three extases. So now, the question becomes, how is the present meaningful to Dasein? Just as we asked about the future and the past. And the print is in the etymology of the word. The present is where things make themselves present. 
It is where things come into having presence. It is where we are directly aware of our own activity. For our actual existence, this is how the presence comes to gain its significance. Any present-at-hand understanding of time as a series of isolated nows is something highly abstracted away from the original experience of temporality. And to sum up what that experience is, I as Dasein have possibilities before me that I always reach out towards. Therefore, I have meaning on the basis of the future. However, I also perform particular actions in situations that become available directly before me. Therefore, I have meaning on the basis of the present. Lastly, I have arrived to where I am able to perform particular actions and exist in particular situations because of past actions that continue to carry weight and be defining. Therefore, I have meaning on the basis of the past. Dasein's being is care. If we remember the rather unwieldy phrase used to describe it, care is being ahead of itself, being already in the world as being alongside entities encountered within the world. But now we can really ground it ontologically. The ultimate ground, that which makes care possible as a unity, is temporality. That is because to be ahead of itself is possible because of the future, to be already in the world is possible because of the past, and to be alongside entities is possible because of the present. Now, all of this seems pretty different from the way we ordinarily conceive of time as a series of constant nows. We have now defined the future as that from which the awareness of possibilities, responsibility, and guilt emerge. The past is that from which the significance we have already been thrown into a world emerges, and the present as the ground by which the possibility of current actions and situations emerges. We might think that this seems like a simplistic and incomplete way to view time, but is it really? Does the view of time as a series of nows actually reflect how we experience it? And if it doesn't, isn't that just a present-at-hand derivation of something that we actually have access to? Heidegger thinks that really, Time as these extases, on the basis of which we come to have meaning, is all that time is at its core. One objection is directly addressed. If we conceive of time in terms of these temporal extases, then all we can really know about time is our own finite existence. After all, time as something we experience and make meaning for ourselves on the basis of is finite. That was the whole point of being towards death and anticipatory resoluteness, after all. But we know that time seems to stretch out infinitely before us or after us, or at the very least it stretches out far before we ever were born and came into existence and will continue for long after we are dead and have passed out of existence. Surely we can in some sense understand these extensions of time that transcend our own finite existence. How can this be the case if time is ultimately understood as something for ourselves to project possibilities onto, come from, and act within? Heidegger assures us, however, that this does not in any way refute the fact that time, in its original, temporal character, is finite. If we remember the distinction between authenticity, being centered around ourselves, and inauthenticity, being not centered around ourselves, we can say that authentic time is finite, while inauthentic time is infinite. The extases of temporality are the foundation of our understanding of ourselves as finite. Therefore, any time we describe time as something infinite, we are describing it based on something other than ourself. And that necessarily means that we are abstracting it away from what is most immediately apparent and primordial. That does not mean that the standard mathematical understanding we have of time is wrong. It is actually quite similar to the discussion of spatiality versus the scientific understanding of space that we touched on early in the text. Temporality is the necessary ontological condition for the being that Dasein has, and our ordinary understanding of time is something we derive on the basis of that. To sum it up, temporality is what makes the care structure possible. The characteristics of care are derived from the three temporal extases of future, past, and present. Temporality is ecstatical in nature, which is to say that it ultimately gains meaning from the way we experience it in terms of future, past, and present. All three are important and constitutive for Dasein, but the most significant of them is the future. Dasein is always reaching out into its future, and the primordial understanding of time that we have is of a time that is finite. Time may indeed be infinite, 
and that is the business of physicists to decide. But as far as it gains meaning for us, time must be finite. Chapter 4. Temporality and Everydayness We have seen how the most basic structure of care, both authentically and inauthentically, is fundamentally temporal to its core. Temporality is the condition on which its structure is possible. However, in the interest of being thorough, it is necessary to revisit all of the preceding existentials, the various characteristics of existence, sketched out in Division 1 and reground them on a more firm ontological base of temporality. There is, after all, a reason we had to spend so much time going through these existentials before arriving at care as the being of Dasein. They are what make up Dasein's average everydayness, and understanding them is a part of understanding Dasein in its totality. Therefore, incorporating them into the temporal interpretation is part of the general spiraling outward structure of the text, where we have to now zoom out and revise everything we already have an awareness of on a new base. This can be tedious. I'll do my best to be thorough here, but if there's any chapter of this book where you don't need to worry about absorbing every detail, it is this one, as long as you follow that we are accurately following the hermeneutic circle by showing how the text is consistent in grounding everything in temporality with no exceptions. The general structure of care, in which Dasein is the disclosedness of a there, as we went over in Division 1, consists of thrownness, and with it disposedness, understanding, and with it projection, and fallenness. All of these existentials are temporal in character. Namely, thrownness is primarily grounded in the ecstasis of the past, understanding in the future, and fallenness in the present. Of course, all of the ecstasis are involved in the temporal nature of each one of them. First, there is understanding. We have to remember that there is both an authentic and inauthentic sort of understanding. It is on the basis of understanding that we are able to draw a distinction between authentic and inauthentic Dasein. This is because understanding is a projection of possibilities. At the beginning of Division 2, we first introduced the distinction between inauthentic expecting and authentic anticipation with regard to the future, namely in being towards death. When inauthentic, Dasein only expects by projecting various possibilities of its average, everyday affairs. When authentic, Dasein anticipates and projects the possibility of its own not-being to become aware of itself as its genuine individual self, and thus is able to wrench back control of itself from the they. The most important extas in understanding is the future. Dasein always projects its possibilities as something that is in the future, whether it does so authentically, oriented around and gaining meaning on the basis of its own being, or inauthentically, oriented around its everyday affairs. It becomes open to any situation as the area for action on the basis of the present, whether authentically, as a chance for its own freedom, or inauthentically, as the they-self, and it takes up its own past as the basis for its current action, either authentically, as something to possess and make its own, or inauthentically, uncritically and automatically. Next, there is thrownness, analyzed as the disposedness that it always manifests in. As we remember, Dasein is always in some mood or another, and our understanding, and with it the disclosedness of our there, is informed by it. We can't possibly hope to examine every mood that there is, so Heidegger focuses on just two that have been important for the analytic thus far, anxiety and fear, and they are supposed to represent authenticity and inauthenticity, respectively. As he introduces the terms anticipation and expecting to distinguish an authentic versus an inauthentic relation to the future, he now introduces the terms repetition and forgetting to distinguish an authentic versus inauthentic relation to the past. We'll explain these in, in detail when we analyze the two moods proper. We'll begin with the inauthentic mood of fear. The most important extas for disposedness is the past. That might seem strange at first, because when we conceive of a disposedness like fear, it seems oriented mostly around the future, 
When we fear something like an out of control fire, an oncoming train, a mugger with a gun, or whatever else, we're seeing it as a future threat that is approaching us. So when we fear, we're largely responding to what we see as an oncoming danger. And that is obviously something that is futural. But his reasoning for the past being the determining extas for fear is that in fearing, we become aware of what exactly is being threatened, ourselves and our having been, what we have been up till now. We are made aware of the security of the past by a future danger. And the present is where our actions in the face of the threat play out. Fear is an inauthentic mood precisely because in fearing, we fear some thing in the world. It happens as we are absorbed in the world. Therefore, the awareness it gives us of the past is also inauthentic, based largely around the world and things in it. This is called Vergessenheit, or forgetting. Anxiety, on the other hand, is the disposedness we have returned to earlier on in the text. In anxiety, everything in the world becomes clear but we see no place for ourselves in it. Of course, this is a futural aspect. We see nowhere for ourselves to take meaningful action, which is oriented towards the future. And in doing so, we as Dasein stand before ourselves in clarity, and we have a full view of who we are. But this, too, has been occasioned by our having been, which is the central extas here, just as it is in fear. We feel all of this on the basis of having previously been absorbed in the world and not having felt so individualized. We have an immediate awareness of this, of sorts, which takes place in the present. And it is not any particular thing in the world that we feel anxiety towards. Anxiety is directed at our own being. The authentic awareness we have of the past, as oriented around ourselves, as the Dasein we are, is called Wiederholung, or repetition. Finally, we must get around to falling. However, unlike projection and thrownness, there can be no division between an authentic and inauthentic falling. By its very nature, falling is inauthentic. Dasein, in its average everydayness, is absorbed in things around it and not aware of its own existence. The central extas of it is the present. That is precisely why we traditionally think of the present as being the locus of our existence. The reason that the present is so important for falling is pretty simple. In falling, we are concerned with whatever actual things are going on around us, and for something to be actual, it must be in the present. The element of the past and future in falling are similarly normal and common sense, an understanding that is restricted to seeing no longer actual and not yet actual events, not taking them up as possibilities that have meaning to us. The inauthentic relationship to the present is called gegenwärtigen, or making present, and it just consists of having a background for actual events. There is no authentic relationship to the present in falling, because falling is inherently inauthentic, but Heidegger's name for such a relation is a, a moment of vision, or Augenblick in German, literally meaning a blink of the eye, and appropriated from the theological tradition and previously found in Luther and Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard. In a moment of vision, we can take the present in terms of possibilities that we are free to choose. This is present in authentic understanding and thrownness. That leaves discourse, which also takes place in disclosure. It is a pretty simple thing to explain. In most languages, we have some sort of tenses to mark some sense of temporality, like future tense, past tense, and so on. This is a sign that language, as derived from discourse, ultimately takes its ground from the temporal nature in which things come to have intelligibility. To sum up this incredibly complex section, understanding is primarily grounded in the future, authentically as anticipation, inauthentically as expecting. Thrownness is primarily grounded in the past, authentically as repetition, inauthentically as forgetting. And falling is primarily grounded in the present as making present. The authentic mode of apprehending the present, not present in falling, is a moment of vision. However, the structure of the anticipation, repetition, moment of vision, in authenticity, or 
expecting, forgetting, and making present in authenticity is contained in each of the three. The care structure where Dasein discloses itself is thus temporal to its core. Of course, with disclosedness comes being in the world, so we should be able to conceive how being in and the world are also temporal in nature. Now it is time out to round out the entire study of Dasein by returning to where we began, with being in the world. But this time, we are exploring its ontological ground. Being in the world is possible on the basis of temporality. Our everyday being in the world, by and large, consists of involved circumspection. That is, our normal relation to and manipulation of equipment. It consists in our engagement with entities, whether they are ready to hand or present at hand. How is this temporal in character? Involved circumspection, during which we manipulate and use ready-to-hand equipment, is broadly speaking a mode of making present, the inauthentic mode of the present extas. Whenever we are involved with equipment for the sake of doing something or other, it is an action that we take in the present, and we do it without an explicit awareness of ourself. To be a little more thorough in investigating this phenomenon, Heidegger explains that our involvement with ready-to-hand equipment consists of gewärtigen, or awaiting, and behalten, or retaining. What do these mean? Let's take the familiar example of a hammer. When we use it, we discover it's towards which, that is to say, how it is appropriate for such and such a purpose or not. This isn't a cognitive thing where we do some intellectual brainstorming, however. It is a way of handling, manipulating, and using the thing. This is awaiting. At the same time, we do so on the basis of how we have come to understand the equipment. We have had some experience using hammers that we act on the basis of, and we have some particular disposition towards it, just as the hammer has its own features and dispositions. This is retaining. Note, however, that all these are still part of the present. We say, I am awaiting, or I am retaining, just as we say, I am hammering this nail. Our involved circumspection is still possible on the ground that the present is meaningful to us. That is to say, that there is a present where we can await and retain the various involvements of the things we engage ourselves with. But we don't only encounter entities as ready to hand. We also encounter them as present at hand. Earlier in the text, Heidegger argued that readiness to hand is prior to presence at hand, and that presence at hand is dependent on it. Now he actually explains how the crossover from ready to hand to present at hand occurs, although it is a bit difficult to follow. From what I understand, largely following Mark A. Rathall and Max Murphy, in order to see things as present at hand, we have to strip away all the lived involvements that we normally encounter them under, so that we can see them in a more abstracted state. And Heidegger argues that we do this on the basis of resoluteness. Namely, we resolve to be committed to the truth and finding out what the truth is by ignoring and resisting our everyday inclinations toward involved circumspection. And of course, resoluteness is only possible on the basis of temporality, namely the future that we project our possibility into. So the present at hand, as something we arrive at on the basis of resoluteness, is also temporal in nature. The entire constitution of something like a world first occurring to us is also possible on the basis of temporality. We know that Dasein is the disclosedness of a particular there, and that as being in the world we come into a certain nexus of intelligibility that is carved out on the basis of our for the sake of which. And a for the sake of which is a possibility. It is a possible way to be. And our projection out into possibilities is possible only on the basis of the futural extas. Of course, for the full phenomenon of the world to come into the fore, we also need the two other extases. The extas of the past finds it finds is also essential for the world because the way that things show up is also conditioned by the circumstances we've been thrown into. And the extas of the present is there because we always manipulate certain equipment for some in order to that is oriented in our present. With this in mind, the world is fully temporal because it is the three temporal extases that create a unity in the world out of these phenomena of thrown circumstances, 
the in order to, and the for the sake of which. Heidegger ends by also pointing out that the whole phenomenon of spatiality discussed early on is dependent on temporality. If you remember from that section, he discussed how any kind of scientific metrical understanding of space is a derived phenomenon from a phenomenal sense of spatiality where we allot things a region in our involved circumspection. Remember the example of the friend we talked to on the phone who is much closer to us than the phone in our hand. But all of this allotment of spatial relevance is only possible when we are in a state of fallenness and absorbed in the things of the world. As such, it is dependent on the extas of the present. Pat yourself on the back if you made it through this section. It is easy to become fatigued at this point, and we are indeed in the home stretch of being in time. The final two chapters discuss the notion of historicality, and a good segue for this section is something that particularly attentive listeners may have picked up on when we discussed being towards death. If you remember from the beginning of this division, death is something that helps us get Dasein as a whole into focus because it provides a definite limit to Dasein and sets up a kind of barrier about what makes Dasein itself. But if we can do that by becoming aware of Dasein's end in death, can we not do the same by analyzing its other end that brackets it, its birth? Chapter 5. Temporality and Historicality Certainly, as much as any Dasein has to come to an end at some point, it also must have a beginning. Any particular human being is born at some point. But this brings up an old problem in philosophy. How do we account for the apparent unity we have over the course of our lives from birth to death, which are very different from each other? What does any particular event I had when I was five years old have to do with one which will happen tomorrow? Traditionally, philosophers would posit some kind of soul substance that lurks beneath the surface. But since Heidegger has done so much work to show that there is no isolated I thing set apart from the world, but only a self that is already in the world and emerges along with it. We can't imagine he would do anything like that. How do we then create any kind of unity out of the past experiences that could make up any Dasein? For Heidegger, it takes place via what is called historicizing, in fact, the way all past events have relevance and gain some kind of unity is via historicizing. So what applies for how we find relevance and unity in past events that we experienced will apply part and parcel for ones that are before our time as well. Now Heidegger takes up the whole theme of historicality. My summary here will often paraphrase Michael Gelvin. Let's look at an example. Let's say we're trying to write a book about the history of any major event or epoch, be it the fall of the Roman Empire, the Protestant Reformation, the Chinese Revolution, or whatever else. What events will be a part of this book? What individuals will we focus on? What dates will it extend to? Surely we have to draw the line somewhere, but how do we decide that? We have to decide it on the basis of something that is already there. That something is what finds a unity and common thread of significance through a whole bunch of disconnected historical events. We have to decide the range of relevant data to input. At the same time, a simple list of events and dates does not a history book make. This would be a timeline, not a genuine history. Not only do we have to have some boundaries we set up, but we have to know what is most meaningful from a historical perspective. There is a reason that we tend to see some events as more meaningful than others. Christopher Columbus's landing in the Americas would be a much more meaningful and significant event for a history of the Aztec Empire than it would be for the history of the Ming Dynasty in China, even though both of them would overlap in terms of the time they span. All of the above goes to show that when we do history, which is to say make past events meaningful to us, what we ultimately do is tell a story in some way or another. This point is driven home by the fact that the German word for history, Geschichte, like the French Histoire, means both history and story. This principle basically applies to all past events, whether they are ones that happen to us or not. 
The way we can group certain ones and find a unity among disparate elements of the past is by finding them somehow significant. So the, now the grand square question is this. On what basis does Dasein take significance from the past, whether that past is its own or not? The answer is authentic historicality, and it must be stressed that this is authentic historicality. An inauthentic historicality would be understanding history solely as a list of past events. Authentic historicality is historicality that gives the past some degree of significance to us. In particular, it is historicality that has some basis in what Heidegger calls Erbe, or heritage, Schicksals, or fate, and Geschick, or destiny. These terms, unlike most others with a special usage in this text, are never explicitly defined, but it becomes pretty clear what he means by them. Heritage, in this sense, is broadly speaking an understanding that we have of past events that somehow affect one's comprehension of oneself. For example, an American might come to see their own personal significance somehow determined by past events like the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, and so on. But it is not just a knowledge of the facts and of these events that constitutes heritage. To have heritage, we have to accept this history as something personally significant, for better or worse. We have to take on the way that this tradition we are grown up into is part of our guilt and responsibility. That doesn't mean we have to submit ourselves to simply becoming a cog in the machine of history. We can, in fact, strike out in new and original ways. Nor does it even mean that we have to become history professors and know every detail about our tradition. We can legitimately take on heritage even on the basis of a very vague and average awareness of our own tradition. But there's never a way to authentically step out outside of any connection to past events whatsoever. If heritage is more or less past-oriented and related to our throneness, fate is more or less future-oriented and related to our future. Yes, in a move that should surprise no one, Heidegger ultimately grounds historicality in temporality as well. Fate by no means implies a kind of inescapable predetermined course that we will inevitably follow. Fate seems to refer to an awareness of our own possibilities, which emerge in a definite range due to the historical context we have been thrown into, that is, our heritage. Fate is the way that we are resolute towards our own authentic possibilities as informed by the significance of past events. It means resolutely accepting the things that may happen, whatever they may be, on the basis of our authentically choosing our own path. If heritage defines the past of historicality and fate its future, he uses the familiar term moment of vision, the authentic mode of making present, to define its present. Heidegger also sometimes uses the term destiny, which seems to be similar to fate, but to apply on a broader scale to peoples or nations instead of individuals. Destiny is therefore when a whole people acts resolutely at once. This has some Hegelian echoes, but Heidegger doesn't really talk about it very much. In general, he uses the word fate to more or less stand for this whole authentic relation to the past. What makes this most interesting is that historicality and our authentic relation to the past is, somewhat surprisingly, not most meaningfully defined by the extas of the past, but the extas of the future. Of course, as authentically temporal, all three extases will be meaningful. But historicality is more oriented to the future than the past. History is a characteristic of Dasein that currently exists. That means because we can only seize on possibilities that are truly our own when we grasp the fate and heritage that makes them most genuine and meaningful. By meaningfully historicizing, we become open to possibilities via an evocation of the past that exceeds our mere fallen everydayness. This becomes most explicit when we consider a, a particular historical artifact. Michael Gelvin brings up the example of a pipe that once belonged to Abraham Lincoln. Is this particular item historical? We would all say it is, but certainly it is not historical on the basis of it no longer existing. Indeed, it sits before us under glass in a museum. 
Potentially, we could pick it up and use it as a pipe, just like any other ready-to-hand pipe in the modern era. But what makes it historical is that the world around it no longer exists. That is to say, it no longer has the same nexus of meaning that allowed it to be used in a ready-to-hand fashion. It is no longer equipment. This might all seem pretty obvious, but it shows something important. The locus of historicality is ultimately in Dasein. It is not particular objects or even events that are historical. It is Dasein's own being in the world that is historical. History is thus about the particular worlds of Daseins that came before us. Heidegger introduces the term world history to explain this. But this does not mean the history of all peoples around the earth in contrast to, say, the history of France. In fact, something particularly focused like the history of the French Revolution would be a far better example of what Heidegger calls world history, because it would be able to focus in more closely on the specific fate and destiny of a specific people, and thus the particular world in the sense of nexus of intelligibility that they existed in. It is always by this awareness of a world that we are able to unify the varied and disparate facts and events of the past. And if what is ultimately historical is being in the world, then now we know how past events can be meaningful to the currently existing Dasein. In an inauthentic historicality, we simply make a list of past events in a timeline. And this is important in its own right, but it isn't really history. In an authentic historicality, we take history as significant in terms of our understanding, that is, our projection of possibilities. In authentic historicality, we recover and make clear the structure of possibilities that once shaped and delimited the relationship between Daseins and entities around them in the circumstances into which worlds of the past were thrown. And doing this makes our own present possibilities more salient and clear. We somehow have to take on the past as a kind of story that we draw meaning on the basis of. Heidegger, in fact, argues that the very activity of doing history in the sense of researching the past is dependent on it. We first have to be able to take the past as meaningful for our future possibilities in order to accurately reconstruct it via history at all. To return to the beginning, we can say in a sense that Dasein is bracketed by its birth, but its relation to this is very different from the bracketing it gets from death. To take our birth as significant is certainly possible, and in fact highly likely, but the general way in which we do it is not that different from the way we take any other past event as significant to us in some way. That is to say, as past events that shaped the culture and tradition we were born up into, and the world as we knew it, etc. We have to take the past as significant authentically, as a part of the heritage we are thrown into, as somehow related to the fate ahead of us, and as important for our current moment of vision. In that sense, what ultimately makes us whole and unified is a historicizing, a grouping of past events, some of which involve us, on the basis of a kind of story of sorts. And what ultimately directs this is our future projection into possibilities. Quote, the more authentically Dasein resolves, and this means that in anticipating death, it understands itself unambiguously in terms of its own most distinctive possibility, the more unequivocally does it choose and find the possibility of its existence, and the less does it do so by accident. Only by ant the anticipation of death is every accidental and provisional possibility driven out. Only being free for death gives Dasein its goal outright and pushes existence into its finitude. Once one has grasped the finitude of one's existence, it snatches one back from the endless multiplicity of possibilities, which offer themselves as closest to one, those of comfortableness, shirking, and taking things lightly, and brings Dasein into the simplicity of its fate. This is how we designate Dasein's primordial historizing, which lies in authentic resoluteness and in which Dasein hands itself down to itself, free for death, in a possibility which it has inherited and yet has chosen. Chapter 6. Temporality and within-timeness 
as the source of the ordinary conception of time. The last chapter of Being and Time has a simple goal to round out everything thus touched on. It seeks to explain how our ordinary conception of time as a successive series of nows is itself ultimately dependent on temporality. I largely rely on Mark A. Rathel and Max Murphy's summary to explain it. It might sound kind of silly and redundant at first to have to show that time is temporal, but it has become clear from the above sections that the original notion of temporality is something very different from our common, everyday, present-at-hand understanding of time. Temporality, as we have touched on, apprehends the extas of the future as that from which the awareness of possibilities, responsibility, and guilt emerge, the extas of the past as that from which the significance we have as already thrown into a world emerges, and the extas of the present as the ground by which the possibility of current actions and situations emerges. This is how we first and foremost experience anything temporal, but this is very different from our ordinary, normal understanding of clock time. How does that understanding of clock time fit into this? In Heidegger's words, we are always reckoning with time in our daily experience, and he means our ordinary understanding of clock time here. We work our jobs according to set shifts, we keep an eye on the time when boiling something on the stovetop, we plan to meet people at a certain time of the day, we constantly orient ourselves in ways that are sensitive to what is happening, has happened, and what will soon happen. Of course, we have some awareness of the way that activities show up in relationships to each other that can be ordered and measured. However, even this is not a mere successive series of nows. Indeed, we might only become aware of what time it is at work when it's 10 minutes until our break. There can be gaps where we stop noticing the sequential or measurable time of our activities. Everyone knows what it's like to lose track of time when becoming invested in something. Time is largely a public phenomenon. The way we make sense of time is born out of the way we make sense of what we do together. Time, in our common understanding, emerges as a way of coordinating activities and accomplishing goals. The division of time into segments like days ultimately was derived from a relation to the sun and the moon. It was born from a cycle of light that made it possible for us to be out and active, and a cycle of darkness during which we had to retreat and wait for the next cycle of light. From this ultimately came a device invented to help coordinate activities more closely on the basis of this public, shared understanding of time, and that device is a clock. It is due to the clock that we get our inauthentic, fallen understanding of time as a series of successive nows. That is not to say that clock time is incorrect by any means. It is correct exactly for what it seeks to measure and accomplish, but it is by no means fundamental. The time on a clock is an interpretation of temporality. It does this by turning time into something present at hand and depriving it of any significance it might have for us. And as we remember, presence at hand is ultimately derivative of our lived, involved circumspection. Clock time is an abstraction of something more real, and it makes sense for our temporality to not follow it. Indeed, there is no way that the past or future could be significant to us if we existed in clock time, because the only thing that would ever be real is the present, and since the past or future would not be existent, there would be no way for us to find them significant. But we experience time as extases, and those are what allow us to project possibilities and give meaning to present actions on the basis of past ones. It is only by our time being ecstatical that we can find the future and past meaningful. All of the above finally can be summarized by saying that Dasein's being is thoroughly temporal. It is only possible for Dasein to exist in the way that it does on the basis of temporality. And this is because we have a real primordial understanding of ecstatical time, not merely present at hand clock time. There is a long history of philosophers struggling to explain how a subject, like ourselves, can exist through a series of successive nows. But that is simply mistaken. That is not how our primordial understanding of temporality is. There is no need to explain how we can enter into time. To be Dasein at all is to be temporal. There is no need to bring us to time. And that's where being and time ends.
The work is unfinished, so this ending seems a bit abrupt. The fundamental question of the book, what is it to be, remains unanswered. If finished, the book would have extrapolated what we learned about the being of Dasein and show that being more generally is also grounded in temporality, and then went on to carefully criticize, engage with, and assess the prior attempts at answering the question of being by Kant, Descartes, and Aristotle. But it was never written. Part of that is because Heidegger himself seemed to grow skeptical that temporality really could act as the ground for all other modes of being. This video will eventually be followed by a similar one, tackling Heidegger's post-being in time thought so we can really see what changes. But in spite of the fact that this work ultimately failed to meet its goal, it is certainly one of the most noble failures in the history of philosophy. French existentialism and phenomenology would not exist without being in time nor would Jacques Derrida in the fields of postmodernism and poststructuralism. Even in the analytic tradition, Heidegger has his admirers. Hubert L. Dreyfus has argued that being time has particular relevance about the problem of artificial intelligence and the nature of what it really means to be human compared to being a computer that can apparently think. Heidegger also was in contact with many members of the Japanese Kyoto School, and the influence of Eastern philosophy seems to have been reciprocal to a good degree. For Heidegger's later career, which I personally think is even more informative and rich than this text, being in time also remains an indispensable background to have. The discussion of Dasein as a clearing and the equiprimordiality of both truth and untruth prefigures his writings on Kant and his critique of the field of Western metaphysics. The discussion of world history and the way worlds can decay and become a part of history prefigures his writings on the role of art and poetry for our being. His talk of science as a structure of orientation and intelligibility prefigures his writings on technology and the struggle for non-technical ways of revealing in the modern age. His discussion on phenomenal distance and the way our world becomes increasingly collapsed by modern technology prefigures his strange and difficult texts on the fourfold of earth, sky, divinities, and mortals. His discussion on discourse and intelligibility prefigures later writings on language, and his description of authentic historicality seems like a clue for the extremely fine and difficult concept of ereignis or inoning that will permeate all his later writings. This brings our discussion of being and time to an end. I hope you enjoyed your time here. Goodbye.